Welcome to Syracuse University. Welcome to our beautiful campus. I'm Gary LaPointe. I'm a professor of practice in, in supply chain management at the Whitman School of Management. And I'm also one of the co-directors of the H.H. Franklin Center in Supply Chain. And I'm going to kind of um, defer my, my formal welcome for a few moments because our undersecretary of um, transportation, Carlos Manye, is on a tight time frame and needs to begin um, promptly at 2.05. So we'll, we'll get that going and um, we'll do a formal welcome after. So is, is Carlos back? Hi, can you hear me, Professor? Can you hear me? There's Carlos. Hello, how are you, sir? Welcome, thank you very much, Carlos. Welcome to Syracuse University. Thank you very much for participating in our Salzburg program. I think it's kind of fitting that this is uh, the 55th anniversary of the Department of Transportation. I think um, last week was the anniversary and then it became law in January of that year. And um, we're very pleased to have you with us today and we look forward to your comments. Well, great. Um, and I, I, it is a pleasure to join uh, the Whitman School and thank you to Dean Anderson and Professor LaPointe, uh, Professor Tucker, uh, who are the co-directors of the Salzburg program for the chance to be with you today. Uh, I'm Undersecretary uh, for Policy at the Department of Transportation, and this is my actually my second uh, turn at the department. Uh, I um, have been uh, in politics and policy for, for my, my career uh, and spent some time at the White House uh, and really wanted to come back to the department uh, because it is um, filled to the brim with professionals uh, who dedicate their lives to excellence. Uh, it is uh, a nonpartisan uh, entity, which means we've been able to get uh, the kind of support uh, to, uh, to, to build um, projects and uh, provide services in a way uh, that, uh, that has garnered uh, bipartisan support. It's also very political uh, in the decisions that are made at the local level. And um, the, you know, the Undersecretary's office uh, has grown uh, over time. It, it, it has uh, about 1,100 employees of the 55,000 or so employees that are at the department. We do the policy work. We have the uh, Build America Bureau, which does our uh, innovative low cost uh, financing programs for uh, states and uh, project sponsors. We have our research and development department, which was a new addition uh, during the Trump administration and our international uh, and aviation affairs, uh, which uh, has been quite busy and, uh, and subject to, um, to uh, a lot of interest uh, from the White House from elsewhere. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, some of the, the big goals uh, that Secretary Buttigieg uh, has set for us here at the department and also our work to, uh, to pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, first of all, this is the second mayor I've worked for who's turned into a uh, secretary, Secretary Cox and Secretary Buttigieg. And mayors are fun people to work for uh, because uh, they also are not not partisan, they're really focused on delivering results and they're impatient for progress. Uh, and they really understand how, how things play out locally. Uh, and so it, it is always a, a pleasure and a challenge. Uh, and uh, Secretary Buttigieg himself is a dream to work for because he's a brilliant, great communicator, also brings a degree of humanity and kindness to the work, uh, which makes it fun and exciting every day. Safety is always gonna be our North Star at the Department of Transportation. And, um, we, uh, we, we have uh, dedicated ourselves, we dedicate ourselves to putting that front and center uh, with a special emphasis on road deaths. Uh, road, road deaths represent more than 94% of, uh, of the deaths uh, in our transportation system. Last year, even as um, uh, total vehicle miles traveled decreased, we saw an increase in roadway deaths. Uh, and so we are working to unveil a strategy uh, to uh, make sure that we have safer cars, that the people operating those cars and the pedestrians and bicyclists are uh, aware of their responsibilities, um, that as new technologies come on board, uh, that uh, people understand when to put their lives in the, in the hands of that technology, and, uh, and uh, that we make safer roads, uh, making, making sure that our uh, roadway design is uh, forgiving to the mistakes that people will make, um, and uh, that all stakeholders have an important responsibility. Uh, climate, uh, you know, that uh, our transportation network is the largest source of, of uh, CO2 emissions in the United States, and we have to be part of the solution. 
as well. And uh, that means uh, making the, the, the car rides that we do have cleaner uh, by investing in electric vehicles, um, uh, by uh, uh, replacing some of the trips that are, that are, being, that are happening, uh, by getting more people on transit, getting more people on active transportation, enabling bicycling and, and walking where that's possible, trying to promote the density that, that uh, makes uh, trips shorter and, uh, and eliminates uh, trips altogether where we can, and importantly, make, making sure that we are looking through the entire life cycle of our um, operations, uh, construction, reducing that climate footprint, and even uh, uh, taking, uh, doing our part to help contribute to sequestering and uh, eliminate CO2 in the environment. Equity uh, is also uh, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the key things that we're really focused on which is for exactly the same reasons I just spoke to, which is that low-income uh, low communities, uh, communities of color are more likely to face uh, traffic crashes and deaths, are more likely to have, uh, to feel the impacts of climate change, uh, to more likely to face asthma because of particular um, emissions on our roads. Uh, and we have to do a better job uh, providing uh, equitable access to opportunities. Uh, it is this, uh, the transportation is the second uh, biggest uh, cost uh, of a, in a family uh, outside of housing. And uh, we have to build our transportation networks in a way that uh, makes it easier and, and more reliable uh, to get to work, to get to those opportunities, to get to school. Transformation. Um, we are seeing a period of dramatic change in, 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 for the better uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, technology. But how do we arm communities to make sure to, that they are able to uh, put their uh, Sorry about that. Uh, to put their uh, values uh, and equities front and center, as opposed to uh, having having being led by the latest widget or the latest um, uh, company that's trying to sell their wares. The um, the infrastructure investment and jobs act bipartisan bill uh, passed with uh, substantial Republican support of the Senate is a really important. Uh, once in a generation, perhaps once in a century opportunity um, for our transportation system. It is, it would represent the largest investment in our roads since the Eisenhower uh, system was, uh, highway system was uh, developed. It's the largest investment in transit in the United States ever, the largest investment in rail uh, since the creation of Amtrak, uh, largest investment in EV investment in electric vehicle investments. Um, it is, uh, represents our, uh, the, best set of tools uh, we could ever hope for uh, in this Congress and this environment to accomplish the goals that I just discussed. It can be really difficult uh, to work in Washington just uh, about a month ago uh, in the midst of uh, the latest congressional fight. We had to simultaneously prepare for implementing a bill that would increase uh, the department's budget by 60% and increase the size of my office by, by 500% um, and prepare for a furlough. Uh, 4,000 of our employees who were subject to, uh, to the highway trust fund. We ended up having to furlough uh, our employees uh, just for a day, uh, but um, it's just part of the complications of, of, of working in a, in, a, in a raucous democratic multi uh, form of government. Um, but I can tell you that um, we've been working ever since before inauguration day, really uh, since before election day, to be ready to take advantage of this opportunity. And it is a once in a career opportunity and we are seeing it in that way. And I think because we've had the opportunity to have the leadership of Secretary Buttigieg, is the access that he's provided us to the White House decision makers. We, we, because we were in such an unusual transition where we um, not only felt the responsibility to staff quickly, but that people at the top of their game, at the best points of their career, were willing to jump back in and serve once again to help the White House uh, draft the proposal to help um, the congressional staff uh, develop the bill. And I believe we're on the, of, uh, the precipice of actually getting across the finish line. We're extremely exciting. We're spending a lot of time getting ready for it now, even as we knock on wood, throw you know, salt over our shoulders. Um, our ambitions in implementing the legislation, and like I mentioned, 60% increase in our, in our budget, you know, 100 million, 100 billion in new discretionary grants over the next five years. Uh, hundreds of programs um, is what the president set out for us, which is that um, he wants to reassure the American people that, that this form of government can work for them. Uh, and so we have a responsibility uh, to make sure that the money we spend is well spent 
that uh, the projects actually end up in the ground that we're able to get the concrete and steel uh, into the ground that uh, we're able to get the new buses, electronic bus, uh, the electric uh, vehicles deployed, uh, that we're able to get a charging infrastructure that gets a half a million new charging stations uh, on the ground that gives people the confidence to be able to, 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 to buy an EV. And uh, we have to do it um, also in a way that increases our um, our competitiveness against China, which is another, not just China, but uh, but uh, that's a major focus of our work, which is how do we build an economy that is more efficient, that allows our goods to get to market. I know that um, I, I've seen the agenda uh, for your session today, and uh, I know the folks that are in the room, the professors and the students and the corporate sponsors are uh, supply chain experts. We've been spending a lot of time uh, on the issue of, uh, you know, our, our, our system is, is, is brittle. You know, and uh, and we need to make those intermodal investments. This this uh, bill would have seventeen billion dollars uh, for port infrastructure, billions more for rail and intermodal investments. Uh, those are the kinds of things that will make uh, make the economy stronger and more resilient for the future. We have some challenges uh, in, in implementing uh, the bill, and I, I think um, uh, a lot of it is is about supply chain at large, uh, which is we are the substantially more people, not only for the department. And, uh, you know, we hire uh, and lose the department to anywhere between 800 and 900 people every year. Uh, and we're going to have to dramatically increase that for ourselves. People like engineers, uh, we're going to need uh, project managers, and uh, grant writers. Um, but for our grantees, we're going to have, we're going to be asking states to, uh, to hire up and, and for them, especially in the rail sector, to, uh, to manage projects bigger than they've ever, ever faced before. So there's a workforce challenge. Uh, there's uh, making sure that American manufacturers, there's an ambition the president has of building a lot more of what we, we, we pay for uh, with uh, the department's funding uh, here in America with good, uh, high paying jobs. Um, there is uh, an additional challenge when it comes to uh, the technical assistance needs of our state partners. We are going to be reaching deeper in the communities and metropolitan planning organizations and cities who haven't been direct recipients of our funding uh, and they're gonna need help um, uh, applying for and putting uh, our money to good use. Uh, we um, need substantial uh, and, and, uh, and the opportunities are, are, pretty, are pretty amazing. And, and like, like I said, this is a once, in a once in a career opportunity for everybody who is at the department and a once in an opportunity for people who are coming in. And I, I would just close my comments and uh, welcome any questions from the audience um, is to consider uh, a job in public service and particularly the Department of Transportation. We are at a really special moment. Uh, the last four years were difficult for a lot of the folks in, that were in the government, but the folks at the department uh, stayed and they, um, they were able to stay on their job because the work we do is so critical because the projects we put on the ground are so politically sound and because they touch people. We have Secretary Green Judge, again, for what's in a generation now, in terms of his, his ability to take incredibly complicated issues and make them understandable to the, to, to the regular people on the street, as, as, as President Biden says. Uh, and so, and we have um, in our new pro programs um, and, and in the core programs an opportunity to really shift the expectations of what people expect uh, from the transportation system to one that is cleaner, safer, more equitable. Uh, we, uh, this, this bill gives us a lot of tools and we're gonna need every bit of expertise to get uh, to, to make the most of it. So uh, again, I wanna thank, um, uh, I wanna thank the organizers of this event, Syracuse, uh, and and um, and look forward to any questions that uh, that you might have. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Secretary. So, what we'll do we'll take some questions from the audience, and um, perhaps maybe I'll start off with a question to get things going a little bit. So I noticed that. The five-year strategy for the Department of Transportation is, is about to run out. I, I shouldn't say run out, but from 2018 to 2022. And so what have you got going for the next 
five-year strategic plan? Have it, is it already been under work? So you have a good idea what that's going to entail? And is it different from what we already had for the past five years? It's a great question. And, and um, you know, a lot of times these strategic plans can be a um, just a paperwork exercise, but we absolutely are not letting that uh, be part of our work this time, which is, you know, there's a standard process that uh, office management budget runs that says, what are your uh, OKRs or KPIs? Uh, what are the things you're, you're hoping to accomplish? And for us, we really are, are building it in the core of our work. Uh, and the, the, the items we discussed earlier, climate, in particular climate and equity, really elevating the role of those, uh, of those goals and setting um, global, um, global goals uh, about you know, what are we gonna do to, uh, with the tools we have to, to reduce the deaths on our roads? What are we gonna do to, um, to accomplish the present goals on EV? Employment and on climate reduction, uh, and um, and we are also going through now the exercise of, you know, uh, figuring out what are the next level um, KPIs that we're going to be using for the bill implementation. Uh, and your standard, you know, measure is often in the government how much money have you spent? You know, what percentage of the money has been obligated? Which is how much has been uh, has been outlaid? And uh, and again, we're we're hoping to have a more ambitious set of goals and and. Um, uh, I believe uh, the, the ultimate uh, schedule for the strategic plan uh, going out is in the, er, the early next year. And I believe uh, there's a public um, period for the draft strategic plan coming out shortly. We're done. So <clears throat> to follow up with that question, so do you engage anyone from the, the the private sector, like private industry to help with these strategic ideas from academia to help with these strategic ideas or um, who's involved in helping, helping you set some of this plan? Well, um, the, you know, our, our engagement with the, with the private sector is, is pretty, um, is pretty robust and, uh, and we, we have an engagement office, but really I, you, you look at the, at the, uh, the, the ecosystem, of, uh, of research and, uh, and industry that, that comes together uh, across our UTC program, across um, our uh, transportation research uh, um, apparatus. And uh, we think it's critical uh, because, especially for these new programs, um, the engagement pieces of it are, are important uh, to make sure that, that we not only have the buy-in and the support uh, but help in crafting the policies because uh, there, there are areas, um, particularly in the emerging transportation space, where we need to co-invent this work together. And uh, we're going to see from us, uh, you know, a, a reinvigoration of our net council, a reinvigoration of, uh, of some of the advisory committees on, on a high tech space. You know, for all of our major uh, challenges, we will often go out with a request for information. There's, a, there's an RFI out on supply chains. Um, got really great feedback. We did an RFI earlier this year. Um, how should we measure and try to accomplish the administration's Justice 40 goals? That's where 40% of our investments in clean uh, climate investments benefits should go to underserved communities. Um, I remember when we talked about those issues with Secretary Fox, um, he really was trying to uh, trying to see the idea. Oh, it's really that um, that uh, you know that, that that these issues have impact equity. The the conversation was advanced substantially, and despite the and so, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, outreach, particularly the private sector, is really critical. Uh, last point I think on that is electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. We're really what we're talking about doing here is this, this building market um, input, not only for manufacturers, uh, OEMs, but also uh, private equity and other people who are actually trying to these investments. Okay, thank you. Here's another question. Hold on. 
I'd like to ask what the level of confidence is in the department about whether the infrastructure bill will pass no matter what happens with the any other bills uh, that may or may not pass. I, um, I try not to, uh, to guess, you know, and I think there's uh, anybody who tells you know exactly what's going to happen. There's a huge incentive to get this right and to get it across the finish line. And I think um, people recognize that uh, the time is, is, is pretty important here and that there's a political imperative to get this done. So uh, I don't know exactly how it play out, but I've, I've remained optimistic throughout the, uh, the, uh, the different news cycles. And, uh, and uh, we've had some good news this week. And uh, I think um, what I've been amazed in is how, um, how involved the president has been and how um, to hear him uh, you know, talk about uh, things like fix it right and uh, you know, other major precepts of like safety uh, to you know, Chairman DeFazio and to Kristen Sinema and um, uh, and to uh, Rob Portman. All, you know, all, all these folks you know, who have been the bipartisan leaders on these really difficult issues um, is quite encouraging. So I, I think we will get it. Okay. Other questions? Oh, hold on a second. I just had a question. We've got a panel later on today about autonomous vehicles and things like that. Where do you see that, I guess, as far as the uh, the plans that you're making and things of that nature? You know, you're also talking about a concern about increased traffic deaths and things. And obviously, there's probably some concerns maybe about autonomous vehicles and trucks and things like that. How does that kind of square? And I guess just in general, autonomous vehicles in general, where do you kind of see that in this mix now and potentially going forward? You know, multifaceted, I would say, is, is the answer. And, um, you know, the statistics uh, are more than 90% of, uh, of traffic deaths uh, and, and crashes are caused by human error. And, uh, and uh, AV technology has, has, the, has the real promise of uh, eliminating that uh, eventually. I, I think we're not there yet. I think it's important to recognize that we're not there yet. Um, don't know if it'll happen in 10 or 20 or 30 years. Um, but we are going to be transitioning to more and more vehicles and having more of these uh, advanced technologies. And we put concrete on the ground, uh, and uh, we have to future proof our technology. And, uh, we have to future proof and, and enable the technology to grow uh, and adapt to these, to these new, uh, to these new uh, opportunities. I think um, in the meantime, uh, we have to make sure that drivers really understand what technology they do have. We have two cars in our family. We had a bicycle car during the uh, during the um, during the pandemic, and uh, they both have really advanced technology, including adaptive cruise control. And they, you know, the, the you drive off a lot, and nobody explains to you how much of, you know how much of your family's lives you should put in the hands of this technology. And I think it's important that human uh, interaction to to be clear for consumers to know how much to trust uh, the technology. I think we need to have serious thoughts about the implications for uh, land use planning. Uh, there is a uh, you know, idealized future where uh, you know, people don't have to own vehicles, but they can, uh, they can use transportation as a service, call up a car and, and there's one right around the corner uh, and uh, we can reclaim uh, you know, streets uh, for, for productive use. Um, and, but there's also a, a dystopian future where we are, um, you know, where there's no, there's no cost uh, to spending two hours in a car uh, because you could spend it uh, watching a movie or doing work or in your family, which would lead to some pretty bad land use decisions. So I think for us, um, I, I think the role of the department, first and foremost, is a safety regulator and second, as a, um, uh, as a thought partner with communities as they, as they work to, to, to put these technologies on the ground. And I'll have to ex excuse myself now uh, for, uh, for a meeting that we've got with the National Economic Council. But uh, again, really want to uh, express my, my deep gratitude for letting me join you today uh, and, uh, and uh, hope that the rest of the, of the uh, session and the other panels are, are successful. Uh, thank you very much.
Mr. Secretary, appreciate your time, your comments, and um, perhaps we can get Syracuse University helped uh, with some of these policy decisions moving forward. We have a great policy program here, as well as a great advisory board of uh, very seasoned and excellent supply chain professionals. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 72nd annual Harry E. Salzburg Memorial Award and Lecture Program. And um, if you've come from out of town and traveled to Syracuse University to our beautiful campus, uh, we welcome you on this beautiful, pleasant autumn afternoon. So the Salzburg Award was established by an endowment by Harry E. Salzburg Jr. in honor of his father, Harry E. Salzburg. Um, Harry E. Salzburg was a transportation industrialist in the late 19th century and early 20th century where he owned and operated several um, rail and public transit companies. The award was established to recognize individuals and companies that made a significant contribution to the field of transportation. And later that was as transportation evolved, um, we expanded that to include logistics and now supply chain. So the Salzburg Award is the oldest and one of the most prestigious transportation supply chain awards in the United States. And over the years, Syracuse University has recognized individuals and companies that have truly shaped transportation supply chain. And a list of those recipients can be found on our website. And we're also fortunate to have the great grandson of Harry Salzburg as a member of our advisory board, John Levine, who's here today as well. So we have an outstanding program this afternoon. We started off with Carlos Magne, um, from the under as a uh, undersecretary of transportation. He is the third ranking um, person in the Department of Transportation. Um, but before we get too far into the program, I want to first recognize some individuals that really helped make the, today's program possible. Uh, Tim Drum, who I don't believe is here uh, right now, the executive director for special initiatives in the Office of Government Relations and Community Relations, uh, was really quite instrumental in helping set up some of our speakers, our under secretary speaker and helping us to make contact with our Salzburg Award recipient, uh, Tesla. We'd like to thank um, Dean Anderson from the Whitman School of uh, Management for his support, to Professor Jamie Winders and Paul Svinland for assembling their very distinguished panels today. My co-directors, um, Fran uh, Tucker and Julie Niederhoff, and for a great team of many individuals who are actually two too numerous to, to name, uh, that make all these aspects of a conference quite possible. Um, you don't realize how much work goes into the, the things that you don't, you kind of take for granted. Um, I can't describe the amount of work that goes into creating this beautiful program that you have in your hands. So it's, it's weeks and weeks and weeks worth of, of labor. Um, the flower arrangements that you see, the water, the candy, the chairs, um, all those things are the responsibility of somebody. And there's a lot of people behind the scenes that do this. So also a special thank you to um, Mike Haney, uh, the Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives and Innovation. Uh, it's also um, the, the, had the vision of creating this National Resource Veterans uh, Center and uh, this beautiful building that we're in, um, the Daniel and Gail Daniello National Veterans Resource Center. And I think it's, it's a beautiful addition to our campus, and I hope you think it is too. This, this, the, the facility is really quite spectacular. Um, it's also a quite fitting facility for our military veterans as well, I think. So we're gonna move on and um, maybe go a little bit out of the, the program and maybe we'll jump to the, the student wards at, at this point. And, um, one of our great pleasures is to be able to recognize uh, some of our outstanding students. And we have a lot of outstanding students. And there's two recognitions that are given by the supply chain department annually. The first is the Walter K. Zinsmeister Award for the outstanding supply chain student. The award is not, is not based solely on uh, academic achievement, but on the well-roundedness in, in supply chain. And each year the selection becomes more and more difficult because the students become, uh, their, their records and credentials really are are quite impressive. And I don't know how if I could even compete if I look at my resume from when I was a, an undergrad, to be honest with you. Um, this year, the supply chain faculty selected a student with an outstanding 3.88 GPA. This student is a triple major, majoring in supply chain from the Whitman School of Management, 
and in economics and in history from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Policy. This student is a Whitman Leadership Scholar, has been on the Dean's List every semester that they've been in at the Syracuse University, is an Investment Success Scholar, a member of the Delta Sigma Pi Professional Business Fraternity, and a recipient of the Whitman Freshman of the Year Award. The student is the Financial Vice President of the Gamma Phi Beta International Sorority, a marketing liaison for the University Union, and this past summer had an internship with Kohl's at their corporate office as a strategic sourcing intern. We are very pleased to award this year's Walter K. Zinsmeister Award as the Outstanding Supply Chain Student to Ms. Jenna Fusco. Jenna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, our second recognition is the Breathe In Scholarship. And to present this recognition, I'd like to introduce Professor Brock Kazaz, um, the Stephen R. Becker Professor of Supply Chain Management and Director of the Breathe In Institute. Brock. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, last year, Breathen Institute announced that it will provide a scholarship in the amount of $7,500 for the best essay on the challenges in designing COVID-19 vaccine supply chains. Um, we asked our students to talk about the development of uh, vaccines, manufacturing capacity, and the deployment of vaccines to different states and to inoculation centers. Students were asked to write an essay and complement it with a 10 minute uh, presentation video. It is my honor to present the latest Britain Scholarship Award to Mr. Ziu Connor Huang. Ziu is a major in supply chain and in accounting with a minor in economics. His GPA is 3.79 and he held supply chain internships at um, HelloFresh and Eli Lilly. In his essay, Ziu broke down the, his discussion into four sections. In the first section, he discussed the development of um, vaccines using a plethora of uh, different methods and, and technologies. In the second section, he talked about cold chains, particularly pertaining to Pfizer, BioNTech's um, uh, vaccine uh, uh, movement. Third, he went to challenges within the United States, given the inconsistent regulations and rules in different states. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, he talked about equitable distribution of vaccines throughout the world, not just in the United States. Congratulations to you. Um, so it's my great pleasure to uh, give you the Breeden Scholarship. I want to say one more thing. Um, this is somewhat related with, uh, uh, with today's recipient of the Breeden Medallion, uh, Tesla, congratulations again. Uh, this year uh, for the Breeden Scholarship, we will seek an essay um, representing the best design for electric vehicle charging station networks for large trucking uh, environment for logistical vehicles. Why is this important? Uh, gas stations and charging stations, they don't go hand in hand. It's a fire hazard. Moreover, 
uh, the charging stations for uh, individual consumer cars is not suitable for large vehicles. Um, the network also requires public-private partnerships, just like we had in the COVID vaccine uh, supply chain development. Uh, but this time, perhaps not so much with minimum volume guarantees, but input versus output subsidies that you can provide for building the capacity versus uh, the sales associated with the charging stations. Uh, naturally, we seek essays uh, that will document supply chain financing for such electric vehicle charging uh, supply chains. I urge you, students, to prepare your essay as if it will be read by the Commissioner of Transportation in the state of New York, uh, Ms. Marie Therese Rodriguez. I invite all of you, especially juniors in the supply chain program, to take on this challenge and provide us insightful feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Barack, and congratulations to our two students. Uh, it was terrific, actually. So let's, uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's okay, because we have a nice, uh, two very nice panel discussions we want to give plenty of time to. So we'll get on with the Salzburg Award. It'd be difficult to identify many companies that have such a dramatic impact on the entire, um, on an entire industry as Tesla has had on the auto industry, I think. So to many, people in the younger generation, it would seem like Tesla invented the electric vehicle um, and everyone else kind of followed along. But the first electric vehicle is not new by any measure. And if you go back and, and do a little bit of um, search on it, the electric vehicle first appeared 130 years ago, believe it or not. Um, and they were actually quite popular at the turn of the century, not the, the, the 21st century, the 20th century, back in the, the you know, late 1800s to early 1900s. Um, the problem with electric vehicles has always been the battery and the cost of production of electric vehicles. And the demand for electric vehicles has actually always been there. They were really quite popular and quite in demand even way back in the, the early 1900s. Um, but the public has always heard from the major automakers that electric vehicles simply just were not practical, that battery technology hadn't provided the, the power um, or the range or the distance that uh, the public, the general public would, would find attractive. Until Elon Musk and Tesla essentially said that we can build an electric car um, that people will want to buy. But the large automakers still played down the electric vehicle. And I clearly remember this as the Tesla was, was coming out into the market. Um, uh, until it became evident that uh, Tesla was going to build an electric car in, in mass production and that the battery technology actually was there and that the, and the, the car could provide the power in the range that the public um, had wanted. And still the automakers um, didn't take it seriously until they started seeing the thousands of orders that were backlogged before the first Tesla actually came off the assembly line. And then the automakers, large automakers really took notice. Without Tesla, I don't believe we would see the rush to develop electric vehicles that we're seeing today. I believe electric vehicles would still be several years down the road, um, if not for Tesla's vision and for their tenacity to challenge a longstanding belief about electric vehicles and, and battery technology. Tesla has spurred an evolutionary change that is impacting the entire global auto industry, not to mention the disruption they've made to the traditional distribution of motor vehicles, which um, actually is, we're, we're finding, we had a discussion this morning, we're finding that, um, Tesla's method of distribution, distributing cars is now being uh, informally adopted by the, uh, the, the traditional car makers because they don't have any cars to sell. So it's almost becoming a, an on-demand um, vehicle market. Um, but we don't really hear too much about that uh, disruption to the industry. So viewed for decades as one of the biggest pollutants of air, Tesla has created a zero emissions movement in the auto industry that automakers now view as a strategic advantage. And now automotive manufacturers cannot get um, to market fast enough with their own uh, electric vehicles and um, fleets of electric vehicles. So in this ever increasing 
um, environmental awareness this year, um, we find it quite fitting and appropriate that we award this year's Salzburg uh, medallion to Tesla. And to accept the award on behalf of Tesla is Albert Gore, their head of policy and development for electric vehicles and autonomous vehicle policy. Uh, Albert? Why don't you give your talk first, and then we'll have the presentation afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Here's a water for you. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, again, uh, Gary, and um, uh, to uh, the Whitman School of Management for the invitation and, and for the award. It feels strange as an individual to be uh, here accepting an award uh, that uh, so many tens of thousands of people worked toward, but um, I was very grateful to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, Tesla and um, where we are in this moment and, and where I think we are uh, in the United States and, and globally as well. So um, Gary uh, asked me to come on a, a, a few minutes earlier than expected. I was running through my presentation, um, I thought about uh, making some excuse, seeing if I could blame the chip shortage somehow and ask for more time. Um, but <laughs> I, I am ready to go. So um, thank you again. Do we have the, uh, the slides? Oh, okay. Oh, great. Um, so first of all, I promise this isn't all about climate change. <laughs> Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, with slideshows about climate change. I, some people have done very well with them. Um, but this is from the IPCC's August report from this year. And um, it shows that uh, we're really in uh, a, a bad situation with uh, global emissions. It's been called uh, by the um, UN Secretary General a red alert for humanity. Um, and the report really shows that um, we now should expect to see uh, significant warming in this century, unless we make rapid and deep reductions in CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions in the next three decades. So a lot of plans are coming together at the state level, the federal level, uh, and, and globally uh, to try to achieve that. Um, Another finding is that there is a much greater uh, correlation observed in the data between uh, the, the severe weather events. We're seeing heat waves in, in the Pacific Northwest, heavy pre precipitation, um, droughts, hurricanes. They're now uh, stronger in the observations. And we should expect to see greater frequency of those things uh, if we don't take uh, rapid and, and, uh, and significant action. There's also a really big difference between one and a half degrees of warming and two degrees of warming. Um, heat extremes, for instance, are far more likely to reach critical tolerance thresholds for agriculture and health uh, if, uh, if we go up to two degrees, um, which again is something that we should expect without um, significant action over the next three decades. So um, net zero emissions is the goal that everyone is working towards. Um, and I just wanted to, to uh, say that that is something that is really uh, elemental to uh, everybody I work with at Tesla, um, starting from the, the top. So um, we can go to the next slide. That's it for climate change for now. <laughs> um, but this is really what drives us. Um, and this is the opportunity uh, that we see to play a role uh, as, as a company, but also as, um, as a, uh, a market actor. And, and you know, we can uh, make a difference in, in these sectors, but we can also uh, create demand and, um, and hopefully pull other, other uh, 
market actors uh, into that uh, zero emission vehicle renewable energy uh, sector sooner than maybe they otherwise would have. So um, I, I, I wanted to highlight just the United States um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by sector, transportation is the biggest single contributing sector. Within transportation, light duty vehicles are almost 60%. So it is the biggest piece of the biggest single uh, contributing sector. It's a huge opportunity uh, to make a big difference quickly with technology that already exists and that is, um, that is evolving very quickly. And 10 years ago, um, electric vehicles were still a, a very uh, niche product. They, they, there was not um, wide adoption of electric vehicles, but we're in a very different place now. And um, feel very lucky to be working in that space and trying to continue to push that forward. Electricity is also a very important factor here because obviously it is the fuel for electric vehicles. So uh, when, when we look at where uh, current sources of US electricity generation uh, are today, um, they're a lot better than they were uh, a decade ago, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. So renewables are, uh, are growing very quickly. Um, natural gas has also grown very quickly recently. Um, and uh, if we are going to, to get over the next three decades to net zero emission electricity, there's a lot of work to be done um, in, in the renewable space. Um, on the uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a good reason to be hopeful about the trajectory we're on. So over the last decade, the last two decades, really, uh, we've seen huge growth in renewables. Um, particularly utility scale wind. Uh, energy storage, utility scale energy storage is a huge, huge piece of the puzzle for um, integrating big utility scale wind and solar into the grid um, to account for the intermittency. And it's gonna be particularly important if we see the type of growth that we are expecting to see in electric vehicle adoption, that uh, we make the grid as clean as possible. Um, so uh, this is, this is a, a snapshot of what we hope is a, is a curve that, that will continue um, on its current trajectory. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our opportunity as uh, a manufacturer of uh, energy storage products, solar products. Uh, we, we build software uh, that, that helps to integrate those energy storage products into the grid uh, in a way where they can actually replace things like natural gas fired pico plants. Um, and, uh, and we also make electric vehicles. So uh, the opportunity for us is electrify the vehicle fleet. We've, we've got a light duty vehicle lineup that has been very successful over the last decade. Um, and we're working on a heavy duty uh, 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 semi as well that uh, I believe is targeted for production uh, next year. So we're really excited about that opportunity. That's a really high utilization vehicle, a lot of vehicle miles traveled out there on semi trucks um, and a big opportunity for emissions reductions. There are other folks uh, working very hard on that as well. Um, and then uh, cleaning the grid obviously is essential uh, to uh, to make electric vehicles work as a as a uh, an emissions uh, a source of emissions reductions, um, and then one thing that we focus really hard on as we are growing now um, very quickly is to to reduce the the product life cycle emissions. So um, making electric vehicles as clean as they can be from uh, uh, mineral extraction, refining. Um, production, and then uh, recycling those materials. Um, one, one good thing about batteries is um, you don't just extract them and use the materials uh, as a fuel and then it's gone or in the atmosphere. Um, you can, uh, they, they stay within the cell and you can take them out uh, at the end of the life of the battery and reuse them and, and, and recapture a lot of the, uh, the energy storage capability there. So. Um, Next slide, please. 
So along with the opportunity is uh, a, a big challenge. So we, we've had, um, I think the biggest challenge over the last decade has been um, how to make electric vehicles uh, popular and um, accepted uh, in a way that they had not been before. So there's been a lot written by academics about the major barriers to adoption of electric vehicles. And, and there's broad consensus around these, uh, these four uh, factors. So price, range, uh, charging availability, per perceived ability to charge along uh, regular routes, and performance and safety. Um, a lot of people still think of EVs as sort of glorified golf carts, and um, we're doing our best to change that perception. Um, what we found is if you can really address each of those barriers to adoption um, successfully, then uh, there are so many benefits to electric vehicles beyond just the environmental benefits. Um, they're fun to drive. You get instant torque to all the motors uh, with, without transmission, without gears. They uh, require very little scheduled maintenance and service. Um, and what service they do require uh, can be done um, in your driveway most of the time. Um, and, uh, and the total cost of ownership is much lower, uh, particularly when gas prices are uh, surging the way that they are now. Um, if you have the ability to charge where you park, you just never think about refueling your car. And, uh, and so if we can address the barriers, and many of them are, are psychological barriers, uh, some, some of them are very real, tangible barriers, um, then the cars really do kind of sell themselves and we can't make, make them fast enough. And that's kind of the situation we're in now, which leads to uh, the next challenge, which is uh, how to increase manufacturing capacity fast enough to keep up with demand. So uh, what Tesla is doing now is we're expanding uh, as, as quickly as we can in California, where we've been uh, in a, uh, a former uh, joint uh, Toyota and GM plant called, uh, it, it was the old Numi plant, which is a, a really cool joint venture. Uh, but we, we um, took that plant over um, after it was closed in 2010, I believe. Um, and we're kind of bursting at the seams there. So we, we, we have a battery manufacturing plant in Nevada, which is also growing very quickly. And we've, uh, we're, we're building factories in Shanghai. That, that plant's been operating since 2019, um, but under construction now are Berlin and Austin, um, which is going to, to significantly increase our manufacturing capacity. And then again, the, the focus on reducing the life cycle, life cycle uh, greenhouse gas footprint of each of our products. So we do that in a few ways, um, trying to make sure we're increasing efficiency um, so that the same product can, can exist longer. Um, and we don't have to, you know, that, that, that customer doesn't need to buy a new, a new one as, as quickly. Uh, utilization, how to, how to get EVs, uh, into the high, highest utilization um, uh, vehicle uh, sector. So ride sharing, um, delivery trucks. Um, this, we've got a, a, re a really pr a big focus on um, if you can increase the utilization of a vehicle high enough, then the, um, the life cycle emissions per mile of that vehicle go down significantly. Um, Supply chain, lo localizing the supply chain where we are making our products. Uh, and then finally, recycling. And I'll, I'll touch on those uh, again in, in a couple minutes. Next slide, please. Um, so focusing on the, the barriers to adoption, um, price is the biggest one for uh, nearly everyone. Um, so I wanted to highlight this because it might be surprising. I, I know that there's a, there is a perception uh, of Teslas as uh, being very expensive cars. But uh, this is from Kelly Blue Book in, in June. Um, uh, US tran average transaction prices in June. We're right in the middle of the pack, but our, our average transaction price is below GM, Volvo, Ford, v, uh, VW, um, Stellantis. Uh, 
it's not surprising to me, um, but uh, most folks, I think, are, su are surprised to hear that we, we've got a, you know, our, our top selling car, the Model 3, starts at a price below the average transaction price of a new car in the United States. Um, and across all of our sales, um, we, are, we are below all those other automakers in terms of average transaction price. So even if that's not um, the perception widely out there, um, it is, uh, it does seem to be apparent to folks who are out uh, shopping for new cars and that's, that's good, we're happy about that. Um, so uh, next slide, please, um, to talk about charging, which is a major, a, a major issue. Um, most folks who come in looking for an EV have never, never owned an EV. They've owned uh, gas cars their entire life. They don't really have any questions about that technology, that fuel availability. Um, but they, they often have a lot of questions about charging. So um, we focused on uh, increasing range uh, in the same size battery as quickly as possible so that our goal is to replace gas cars. We, we don't want to make products that um, you know, are fun to drive for maybe daily commutes or whatever, but you need your gas car for uh, you know, the trips that you take twice a year, four times a year. We want to replace those gas cars uh, for everything that, that they are used for. Um, and that's how people generally shop for, uh, for cars like this. Um, our data shows that uh, the, lo the longer the range of our vehicles, the less people use the, the fast charging network, um, the more they're able to charge where they park, which is about 80% of charging is, is just where people park. Um, but since 2012, we've increased the range of the Model S by over 50%, and same, same size battery. So 265 miles to 405 miles of range. And that, uh, that is generally true across all of our models, um, including the, the Model 3. Uh, availability of charging has been a major focus since the very beginning. So we started building the supercharger network, which is a, a DC fast charger in 2012. And um, we're just under 30,000 um, supercharger uh, stalls globally today. Um, for the last two years, we've been uh, deploying a, a version three supercharger, which is a 250 kilowatt uh, charger that can, uh, at, at peak efficiency, um, recover about 200 miles of range in 15 minutes. Um, so it's it, if you come into a supercharger with a relatively low state of charge, say say 20%, 30%, and you plug in um, and you're in a Model 3 or a Model Y or one of the new uh, Model S or Xs, then your um, charging rate is going to be over 1,000 miles of range per hour for that initial um, you know, 10, 15 minutes. It's really, really cool. Uh, it's a perfect amount of time to go in and get a cup of coffee and come out and um, you're ready to drive for another three hours uh, till, till you might wanna stop for 10 minutes again. Um, next slide, please. Performance and safety, um, again, has been a, uh, a, a major um, perception issue, I think, for a lot of folks about electric vehicles. Um, we uh, have achieved five-star crash ratings for, for all of our vehicles. Um, but the Model 3 um, in particular had the, the best vehicle safety score ever recorded uh, when it was tested um, by NHTSA. That's according to NHTSA um, data. Um, that's not something that NHTSA will say, but um, if you look at the data, it, 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 it tested higher than, than any other car ever had. Um, and uh, the Model Y had the lowest rollover risk for any SUV ever tested. The great thing about EVs, and this is, I think, going to be true generally of EVs, because um, I think most uh, manufacturers are are looking at the same type of architecture that we've used. But you you can put the uh, build the the battery into the chassis so that the battery effectively is the chassis. It's very rigid. It's very safe in a side collision, and it's got a very very low center of gravity. So those are all things that make the car much much safer generally. Um, uh, compared to, to gas cars. On performance, I know it's kind of silly to um, talk about uh, zero to 60 and top speed um, when we're talking about emissions reductions and the mission and all that. 
Um, but uh, it, it really, I think, has um, made a difference in um, overcoming the perception of electric vehicles as, uh, as big golf carts. Um, to have uh, cars out there that are doing zero to 60 in three seconds or under two seconds um, because the, uh, the, the ability to deliver that amount of torque to all, all the motors at once is, um, it creates some, some really amazing performance. And for people who grew up like muscle cars, that's a really cool thing that might get them interested in EVs in, in a way that other things would not have. Um, next slide. In terms of um, uh, performance and longevity, a lot of people have questions about battery replacement. Um, how long is the battery going to last and what's the um, degradation gonna be of the range? They perform very well. So this is Model S and X battery capacity over 200,000 miles. Um, so you can see uh, on average, they're retaining close to 90% of their range over that distance. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, just circling back, uh, here to life cycle emissions. So, um, the most important, uh, variable that we look at in, in life cycle emissions is, is the real world fuel consumption or electricity consumption. So we've looked at 10 billion miles traveled, uh, by the model three fleet that's out there. Um, and we've, we've used publicly available data from consumer reports to really do a comparison um, to the average internal combustion engine vehicle that's out there. And, um, you know, we, we, we assume the, you know, the average 2020 midsize premium sedan has about 24 miles per gallon. Um, average U.S. driver travels about 12,000 miles a year for about 17 years on a vehicle until uh, it's scrapped. So based on all of that analysis, uh, even now where uh, the manufacturing emissions for an EV are slightly higher than for that average midsize sedan, um, after 5,340 miles, the, the lifetime emissions of that vehicle uh, for the EV are already lower than, than the internal combustion engine vehicle and will continue to get lower over time. Um, and that's something that I think um, is important for us and others to to track and to communicate um, so that people know if somebody says, well, the vehicle still got to be charged from the grid. That's true. There, it's true that there were a lot of emissions that went into extracting the minerals for the battery to manufacturing uh, the cells. Um, but even if you look at all of that, um, these vehicles uh, within 5,300 miles are already um, uh, showing lower emissions than, than a gas car, and that continues into the future. Um, next slide, please. So obviously, cleaning the grid makes a big difference. Um, the grid is getting cleaner over time. Um, gas is, is not getting cleaner. Fuel efficiency is increasing, but, but very slowly. And sometimes it's, it's two steps forward and one step back when, when you're talking about uh, emission standards. Um, but uh, charging EVs is getting less uh, carbon intensive every single year. Uh, I showed the graph earlier about renewable uh, electricity. That is uh, growing rapidly. Uh, in this year, wind solar battery storage uh, are expected to account for 81% of new electricity generation capacity. That's a huge, huge difference from a decade ago. Um, and it, it varies from state to state, but New York is one of the states that is leading the way in this regard. New York passed a, uh, what was the, the strongest climate law in the country uh, in 2019, CLCPA. Um, and California uh, is, is another really great example. But um, for states that are really focused on reducing emissions in the electricity sector, um, these returns uh, on emissions reductions are, are much, much higher. So I, I just wanted to show a side by side of the average life cycle emissions versus the average life cycle emissions in New York State because the grid is so much cleaner here. Um, on average, if you charge uh, uh, a Tesla here, um, the carbon intensity of the electricity is the equivalent to 
uh, a gas car that gets 135 miles per gallon. And that is increasing all the time. And you see some places in the state where it's significantly higher than that, um, depending on whether they're getting a lot of hydro or whether they're getting um, a lot of offshore wind, which is um, increasing every day here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so supply chain localization um, is also really important when we're talking about efficiency of operations and also reducing emissions. So uh, it, it is in alignment with our mission to uh, reduce the emissions upstream of our factories as well, including the carbon footprint of our supply chain. So uh, when it comes to subcomponent manufacturing, such as the, the instrument panel, large stamped portions of the vehicle body, uh, we believe the closer they're manufactured to our factories, the better. So uh, we've really focused on um, using local suppliers where our factories are located. Uh, and as a, as a testament to that, in, in the United States, there was a study that came out this year from cars.com. Uh, it, it's called the um, American Made Index. And we have the number one most American made car in the Model 3 and also, and also the, uh, the number three, which is the Model Y. Um, and we're very, very proud of that because um, yes, it, there are benefits to the uh, emissions footprint. There are benefits to uh, the company in terms of manufacturing. It minimizes disruption to the supply chain when, when you localize it, but also uh, it supports the local community, supports the workforce, um, and, and aligns us with the broader goal of you know, reinvigorating American manufacturing, which um, we are really, really excited to be a part of that effort. Um, next slide, please. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but one of the reasons that we do talk about ride sharing, um, and we are excited about the future of autonomous vehicle um, uh, technology, is that when you do increase utilization, you know, we're, we're talking about um, uh, the uh, manufacturing phase um, and then the use phase. The use phase, we know how to measure electricity versus carbon fuels. Um, but when you're talking about the life cycle emissions that are already baked in during the manufacturing phase on a per mile basis, the more miles that vehicle travels, uh, the, the lower those uh, manufacturing phase emissions are on a per mile basis. That is a, a, a really important factor in, in focusing on things like ride sharing and uh, uh, freight delivery trucks, things like that. Um, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just include the last point there, which is that when, when we think about a, a single future Tesla vehicle that has a million mile battery, which is the goal, um, with the, the new battery technology that we are putting in uh, to our new factories. Um, it can be utilized over five times more than an average vehicle in the US. And that's a, that, that means that's another vehicle that doesn't need to be manufactured um, if that vehicle is still in use. Uh, next slide, please. And just to, just to, um, to highlight that point, you know, we, we are developing in-house recycling uh, capabilities in all of our factories now, um, but we we still believe that from a sustainability perspective, longer battery longevity is the most sustainable option. So um, we're focused on software uh, and and other updates that we can do to extend the range across the same number of cells, the same size battery, uh, and then when it does finally come to its uh, its end of life, that's when we can extract. Uh, what is still in the cell and recycle it. And the efficiency of the recycling process is really high. Um, you can, uh, in theory, take on a, a thousand kilowatt hour uh, worth of end of life batteries and extract raw materials uh, of 921 kilowatt hours. So there's a, there's a significant opportunity in recycling. Next slide, please. Um, I know um, we're, I'm probably getting close to my time. So somebody tell me if, uh, if I'm going over it. But um, when I think about logistics, um, in general, I think about distribution logistics because um, we have a different model for selling cars than uh, has been used for the last century or so in the United States. We sell uh, direct to consumer um, through our own retail footprint. 
we're able to do that because you know e-commerce is a big is a big thing now. People are very comfortable with it. We have flat pricing um, across the board, and uh, but it is a it is a, a significant challenge to um, to deliver as many vehicles as we do in the United States, which is my focus, through 140 stores, which is what we have here. Um, when you look at franchise dealerships, there are about 17,000 uh, of them across the country, and they sell, you know, on, in an average pre-COVID year, about 17 million cars. So, thousand cars a dealership. Um, we we do significantly more than that. I, I'll use New York State as an example. Um, we have five stores here. By law, we're capped at five, um, which is a whole other story, which I'm happy to tell if anyone wants to hear it. But um, we, we sold 10,000 cars here last year, um, 2,000 um, per store. And actually in the, in the month of June, um, we delivered 2,700 um, in just one month, which uh, you know, is about half the volume of a per store of a full year for a dealership. So um, we spend a lot of time on that type of logistics. And uh, I spend a lot of time on the policy side of it as well, trying to uh, open more stores where, where we can. There's actually a pretty, pretty significant correlation here between states that, that uh, have restrictions on the number of uh, stores we can open and uh, a relatively low um, uh, per capita electric vehicle registration number. Um, so well, why don't you share why there's only five stores? Okay, I'll be happy to. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide? I don't know if I put it in here. Um, uh, well, that was just a little bit of bragging. We, we, uh, last year, we, we, we sold 79% of, of the EVs that were registered in the US. Um, maybe it's on the next slide. Um, so uh, again, we, we've always sold direct. In most states, it's, uh, the franchise law is written um, has been written over several decades, basically to govern the relationship between a, a local dealer and uh, a manufacturer. So that, that came about in the middle of the last century when uh, GM was the biggest, most profitable company in the world in the, in the 50s and 60s, and had franchise agreements with dealers all over the country, and they were renegotiated every few years. Um, and that was a difficult negotiation, you know, the biggest company in the world and a local sort of mom and pop dealer. Um, so, uh, so state law started to sort of uh, attempt to level that playing field by building in a lot of aspects of a franchise agreement um, that would say like restrict what the manufacturer could do into state law. So it didn't need to be renegotiated um, every five years. One of those, uh, one of those provisions um, in a lot of states is that the manufacturer can't compete uh, with its local dealers in selling at retail, which I think is very fair. Um, but there, once Tesla started growing, uh, and really 2013, 14, 15, is, uh, is when a lot of these laws started to pop up around the country, including New York. Um, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, three examples in this region. They basically said, all right, that's enough. You've opened five stores here, no more, but you can keep the five that you have. And um, nobody else can do what you did. So now we're in a situation where um, you know, we, we're kind of bursting at the seams and we've got Rivian, who's got the first electric pickup truck on the market now. Um, Lucid is another EV manufacturer um, that is making a, a 500 plus mile range sedan, um, also blocked entirely from selling in New York State. So it really doesn't make sense to, to maintain the current law the way it is. Um, given the situation we're in with climate change, with the CLCPA. Um, and also it's just not great to tell a company that wants to open in your state that, you, that they can't do it. Um, unless there's a good reason, but I, don't, I, I would argue that there's not. So the law, the law used to be very clear. It actually went up to the New York Supreme Court in 2013. And uh, uh, there, there was a very clear opinion that no, this law was written to govern franchising manufacturers. It shouldn't prevent uh, a company like Tesla from selling directly. So the next year they came back and changed the law. Um, that's almost the whole story, but I'm happy to get into more detail there. I, I will say that 
New York is the most constrained market for us anywhere. Um, in terms of, we do more deliveries per week per employee here than anywhere in the world. Double what we do in California. Um, uh, again, we do about 50% more deliveries in, in one quarter out of one of our New York uh, locations than an average dealership does in a year. And um, if you look at total number of EVs sold in New York last year, per Tesla store, we did about 2,000. Per franchise dealership, they did about 2.1. So not to say anything bad about dealers. I'm, I, I, I'm, my attitude is we're all in this together. We all need to sell as many EVs as possible. But uh, I think there's a big opportunity to um, make more progress here. Terrific. Are you ready to uh, maybe take some questions from the audience? Albert, you got more uh, you'd like to share? Sure. I, I think that might be, um, let me just double check here. Um, I have, yeah, I have, I have one more slide that okay. I can show. Sure. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is just about sort of our business model, um, which is important, uh, to know how it's sort of distinct from, um, the, the traditional model. Um, uh, but in general, you know, we, we only make money on the sale of the car all the other stuff, um, service in particular, which is about 50% of the gross profit of an average dealership um, is not a profit center for Tesla. And same with, um, in general, finance, uh, trade ends, used vehicles, they're not drivers of profit. We're sort of oriented entirely around selling new electric vehicles because um, that's our mission, turn over the vehicle fleet as quickly as possible. So it is a very different model um, than, than currently exists out there. And I have one more slide just that I think highlights why this type of policy does matter. Um, Florida uh, has been an open market for us and any other EV manufacturer um, without franchise dealers to open as many stores as we want. So it's our second biggest state outside of California. Doesn't have any of the policies that exist in New York. Uh, no ZEV mandate, no EV incentive. Um, but because we've opened into a footprint of 17 stores there. Uh, we sell, um, we've sold twice as many cars. We sell, we're growing at about a 65% higher rate. Um, and we contribute more than twice as much in sales tax revenue last year, despite New York spending a lot of money to encourage EV adoption. So this is one of the things that, that um, we're working with a coalition of environmental groups and, and other EV manufacturers to address. I, I'm confident that this will be short-lived and we'll, we'll, we'll move past this, you know, in the next year or two. Um, it doesn't, it's not an issue in many, many states, California, Massachusetts, some surprising states, Missouri, Utah, Arizona. Um, uh, and I think we're in 19 or 20 now with just, uh, without this restriction. So, um, where we see opportunities to, to grow, uh, deployment, we've, you know, we do spend a lot of time trying to address them. So do I understand it correctly? If you, my Tesla needs maintenance, they don't charge me to have it repaired? They, so if it's under, if it's a warranty repair, then no, you don't get right. charged. But um, no, what, it, what I mean by it's not a profit center is that um, we don't derive any profit from the transaction. It's basically offered at our cost to provide it. Um, so a, a typical dealership, uh, on average books a significant margin, like 47, 50% margin on um, a non-warranty service uh, job or parts sales, things like that. So we, we generally view those as things that we provide at cost. Um, and it's part of the philosophy. Um, and it works out well too, because there is not a significant amount of service and scheduled maintenance relative to what we're used to with gas cars. Mm -hmm. So we've got a big service center footprint um, across the country. We also have a, a, a growing mobile service fleet, over a thousand um, bands with service techs that will come to a customer's home or place of business. And, uh, you know, an hour later, uh, your, your car's fixed, basically. Um, it's, a, it, it's very easy to do because about 80% of service jobs on an EV don't require the car to be put on a lift. So um, can be done very easily 
uh, through that mobile service fleet. Wow, terrific. Uh, some questions? Sure. Yes. I have two questions. The first is, uh, how does the, the lifetime maintenance cost of, of a Tesla compare to an internal combustion car? And the second is, how come you guys are so bad at estimating delivery dates? <laughs> oh, man. Um, the first question is easier to answer. Is that because um, you've ordered one, uh, John? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I, I saw a recent study, um, and I'm trying to remember the source, um, but I think it was Argonne National Lab that looked at scheduled maintenance. So um, not unexpected things that come up, but, the, but scheduled maintenance. And for uh, battery electric vehicles generally, so it wasn't singling out Tesla, it was 41 cents to a dollar for a gas car. So, um, you know, obviously there are things that come up, there's maybe warranty repairs, there may be, um, things beyond um, scheduled maintenance, but um, that's the one that's easiest to quantify. On delivery dates, I'm gonna blame the chip shortage on that one, if that's right. <laughs> no, I think, I think we had our earnings call last night and um, safe to just repeat what they said, which is um, that there, there, have, there have been some disruptions, but um, you know, in general, we've been able to deal with them um, fairly quickly. I think on the previous earnings call, Elon told uh, a story about a chip supplier um, that had it, was unable to continue to supply chips. We had to move to another one and, and they were able to sort of rewrite the software in a, in a matter of weeks. I don't know how that is all playing into this current, um, the delivery timeline, say for the new Model X or, um, or the, the Model Y I have several you know, friends who are also in the delivery pipeline. Um, and, I, and I think, yeah, it's, my understanding is based on what they said, um, that there are some disruptions out there. But um, if, if, uh, if I can get you a better answer, I will. Other questions? Yes. Hi, so I know a really big part of Tesla is energy generation and storage. And I think there's been a lot of really interesting stuff with like shortages and blackouts abroad and also sky time, sky high prices here. What do you think Tesla is doing to kind of solve and um, brace for those issues? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we've um, been able to sort of demonstrate the capability of uh, our utility scale storage products in situations like that, like in South Australia, where they had brownouts um, and uh, there was sort of a, a dire need to solve the issue on a short timeline. And I think we did it within a hundred days. I think, I think Elon responded to the guy on Twitter and committed to doing it and, and we did it. And it actually has performed, I think, better than um, expected because of the auto bidder software that, um, that we, have created and it, and it, I don't, I don't know all of the details well enough to, to, to explain all the ways in which it's performing better than expected. But um, there have been other situations like that in Southern California. Um, I think there is a, um, obviously a discussion in Texas about um, how to, um, how to address some of the things that happen in, in that grid. And, uh, and from what I understand, based on what uh, we've said publicly, we're involved in those. So um, there, there is always a big opportunity um, in those uh, crises. You know, you never, you never want to see the grid um, failing in that way, um, but it, it is an opportunity to demonstrate what energy storage can do. We're gonna probably be early. Carol Kaufman gonna be ready. Yeah, she's on. Okay. Was was that a question for me? No, that was my fault. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Another question. Oh, over here. Hang on.
it's non-vehicle related, but I did want to ask um, what Tesla's plan is for the Buffalo, New York plant. That's probably one of the closest ones to this facility. And I wanted to get an idea as to what the future plan is for that facility that was built in Buffalo, New York recently. Yes. Oh, great question. And we spent a lot of time there. Um, we are, we've already located um, several different product lines. I mean, the, the, main, the main function of that plant is solar roof. Um, so uh, that product is out there being deployed. It's, uh, it looks great. It's difficult to install. Um, and I think uh, that's been a challenge that um, we've spent a lot of time trying to address. But uh, the, the product is, is great. And so that's, I believe, going to be the main um, driver there. But there are um, supercharger cabinets are, uh, that, that go around the world, are manufactured there, power electronics for the uh, supercharger and um, Megapack, the, the, you know, uh, large scale um, energy storage products are manufactured there. Um, a number of other electrical components. And um, there's a, uh, a team that, that trains the, uh, the AI for um, uh, the autopilot visual system that's now located in Buffalo as well. So there's been uh, a lot of new functions located there that are growing really, really quickly. So I'm, I'm excited about the future of that plant. So thanks for that presentation. It was really interesting to hear. We've got um, some students in the room and a lot of us also teach students. So if you think about say four or five, 10 years from now when these students are, are kind of going into the job market and they're wanting to be emerging leaders, what advice would you give our students um, so that they could be uh, effective leaders in, in kind of what's coming? Mm. Um. I, when I learn that, I'll come back and tell you guys. I guess. Um, well, I was a I was a business school student um, seven seven years ago, uh, and um, didn't know what I wanted to do. I w wanted to change careers, and um, worked as a research assistant to a, a professor that was working on a, a book on renewable energy finance, and was. Um, blown away by the growth in rooftop solar at the time, which was something that um, I had been interested in for a long time, but did not seem to be scaling in the way that it needed to. And I wasn't really clear on the reasons why. So um, I was sort of struck by that. Um, and I just sort of focused on, it, it was something that seemed really exciting, really dynamic and also really interesting. And um, so I sort of sunk my teeth into it and ended up at a rooftop solar company that was acquired by Tesla. That's, that's how I ended up here. But um, my, my best advice would be, there's a lot of stuff that is really dynamic right now. And um, electric vehicles is definitely one of them, but there are many other things. So um, for people who are looking for a career that is, fulfilling and, and meaningful and, and also challenging and, um, uh, you know, um, something that will continue to be interesting and, and challenging for many, many years. I think this field of renewable energy, clean transportation is a great field to be in. That would be my recommendation. Any questions, questions from any of the students? Hi, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, um, I know that Tesla is expanding uh, in different countries, and I'm just wondering, like, um, are there any, like, uh, challenges that, like, um, you kick off facilities um, in different countries? For example, except for Shanghai and Berlin, will there be any other country you guys are interested in? And um, will there be any extra challenges, like the government regulation or environmental policy that um, um, is, like, a challenge for, for the development of Tesla? It's, it's a great question, um, and unfortunately, one that I don't have any visibility into. My focus is exclusively um, 
US. So um, I'm, I'm sure that there are, um, but I think, uh, I think in, in general, our, you know, from, from what I know, our experience has been very good. Other questions? No? Um, I guess in terms of resiliency, I mean, there's so many things happening now in the supply chain, you got the, the chip shortage. Now we read just recently, there's gonna be a magnesium shortage, which is used to make aluminum. So all the car manufacturers are gonna suffer. Um, how, how is Tesla, can, can you even plan for anything like this? And how, do you, how are you creating this, this resilient supply chain for the company? Um, I, I know that it is a big focus. We actually, um, our, our shareholder, annual shareholder meeting last year, um, we did something called Battery Day, where the smartest folks at our company on battery technology engineering and, and how it fits into the vehicle spoke for a long time. And it's online if anybody uh, is interested in, uh, in checking it out. If you go to the Tesla Investor Relations um, and look at the 2020 shareholder day. There's a, uh, there's a uh, PowerPoint presentation and also uh, a webcast that I would highly recommend. But um, I know that there has been a focus on being flexible in terms of um, the battery components. I, I, I think there was a comment last night about using iron-based batteries um, for some of the, not for the longest range ones, but for some of the um, medium range vehicles um, to account for, you know, anticipated um, uh, shortages or bottlenecks in that supply chain. So um, I think flexibility is the, the major sort of guiding philosophy for our folks um, when, they, when they think about how to account for, you know, anticipated disruptions in the supply chain. Questions before we'll proceed with the, the presentation. There's no other questions. No? I was saying I've never had slides on such a big screen know, before. Big screen. <laughs> they want to be much more detail oriented. So um, we're Syracuse University is, is really pleased to be able to present the Salzburg Medallion and the Chancellor's Citation for Excellence for Tesla. And I'd like to read this um, if I may. Tesla is a world leader in and a champion of advanced automotive technologies. Tesla has consist, constantly pushed the envelope in the development of electric vehicle design, battery technology, and autonomous vehicle operation. This focus on forward technologies and realization of a viable electric car infrastructure has motivated much of the transportation industry to believe in life beyond fossil fuels. Virtually every leading manufacturer is now either producing or committed to producing electric vehicle fleets. Some auto manufacturers have even dared to proclaim the previously unthinkable, the planned retirement of the internal combustion engine. This is a much needed industry revolution if humans are to effectively address the problems of greenhouse gas emissions and anthropogenic climate change. Thus, Tesla's technological and industrial um, leadership has a significant positive effect, not only on transportation, but on the sustainability of the global environment. In witness there, whereof, I hereby proclaim my name and the university seal on this 21st of October, 2021, Ken Severud, Chancellor and Vice President of Syracuse University. And to present this is our new Vice Chancellor and Provost um, Gretchen Ritter. Thank you so much. Very well said, the uh, instruction. Yeah, no,
And to go along with the Chancellor's citation, we have the, the very beautiful and handsome Salzburg medallion um, that goes along with us. And so um, we'll present that to Tesla as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much. And so we're going to continue on with our program with our first panel discussion. And I'd like to invite uh, Professor Jamie Wenders up and uh, to get her panel organized. And we'll get the um, panelists mic'd as well at this point. Um, this is a, another very relevant, I think, panel discussion. I think you're going to find it quite interesting on the, you know, we have a, an autonomous um, policy institute here at Syracuse University that is directed by Professor um, Winders, Winders, and um, um, it's quite relevant to today, and really, uh, when you start thinking about how will autonomous um, vehicles impact the future supply chain as well. So, um, professor, please come on up. So while folks are getting mic'd up, um, let me just say thanks to Gary for uh, inviting me to be part of this event. And I want to thank all the folks who helped make it possible. We've heard some really impressive um, and deep discussions about the, the current state and the future of transportation and logistics. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this conversation while we get our other folks uh, mic'd up. And I can see Cara in front of me in the screen. So my name is Jamie Winders, as Gary mentioned. I'm a professor in the geography department, and I also direct the Autonomous Systems Policy Institute, which we affectionately call ASPE. And one of our goals at ASPE is really to support and expand interdisciplinary engagement around autonomous systems and AI, and then to put that engagement in conversation with trends in policy and industry, um, and the wider uses and impacts of autonomous systems and AI. So I'm especially thrilled to be moderating this panel on autonomous systems and, and the future of supply chains because it sits at that exact intersection of academia with industry and policy and the wider societal impacts. So we have some really amazing panelists joining us today. Their work really sits at the cutting edge of innovation, um, an engagement with everything from how we price autonomous vehicles to how we build more efficient and more versatile drones. Um, they engage questions of policy, public perception, design, the economic impacts of AVs, infrastructure, social impacts, policy and regulations, markets, you name it, they cover it. Um, and they bring expertise in, in fields from transportation, engineering, civil and electrical engineering, transportation economics, aerospace, public policy, and the social sciences. And really, this is the perfect mix to think about what the undersecretary described as that multifaceted topics of how AVs are going to impact the world around us. Um, so joining us on Zoom today, we have, um, let me just do some quick introductions. Dr. Um, Cara Cockleman, who's the DeWitt Greer Centennial Professor of Transportation Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin. We know Texas is rapidly becoming an, if not the, epicenter of a lot of really innovative work in autonomous systems. And CARA's work addresses many of the foundational questions linked to the building out um, and scaling up of these emergent technologies. So she's received many awards um, for her research, including being named one of the top 20 influential women in mobility in 2020. Her research engages really timely questions like how will AVs, including in fleet settings, transform driving patterns and behaviors. And I might add that her publications on this topic are among the most cited in her field. Um, but what's really impressive about Cara's work is it goes beyond academia and she regularly contributes to wider conversations and policy debates about how AVs are transforming our transportation systems, our cities, our economies and other aspects of daily life. So I'm super excited that she could join us. So joining us in person, we also have Dave Whitaker, who is the Chief of Development 
at the Northeast UAS Airspace Integration Research Alliance, or what we call New Air. And we're really lucky to have him and to have New Air here in New York. And New Air is a New York-based nonprofit organization that's really focused on providing expertise in unmanned aircraft systems in their operations and their safety management um, and in consulting services. And New Air oversees uh, the build out and expansion of New York's 50 mile FAA designated um, testing corridor for drones and it's one of seven in the country so they play a really important role not only in the ecosystem in this area but also in the national development of um, this the sort of emerging economies around drones at New Air Dave plays a really important role in developing businesses and markets that are linked um, to urban air mobility to UAS, as well as um, the newer field of advanced air mobility, or what I like to call it as air taxis. Um, he is in fact an alumna, alum of the Whitman School of Management where he received his MBA. And he's also an alum of our College of Engineering and Computer Science where he received a graduate degree in electrical engineering and, and communication systems. So he embodies that mix that we're trying to get around business development as well as the design. Um, and he brings to this panel, as well as to his work with New Air, deep experience um, in the business development side of aerospace industries. And then last, but certainly not least, we have um, with us Andy Maxwell, who is the Senior Program Manager and Innovation Strategist for CNS Companies. And Andy brings really extensive experience in public service, um, planning, community development. He's also an SU alum of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, where he received his master's in public administration. And one of the things that I, that's really impressive about Andy is he bridges, um, or really creates a bridge between industry innovation around emerging technologies um, and questions of community planning and equity. So he brings a background in public administration, having led initiatives throughout Syracuse around innovation and new approaches to urban governance. He also thinks about these issues through the lens of equitable business development. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciate most about Andy's work with autonomous systems is that he's always thinking about and approaching them from a business perspective, a policy perspective, a design perspective, and a community impact perspective all at once. And he really understands how these different facets are connected and he brings that complexity to his work on design and construction and engineering. So having to sit here with all these folks, I'm very happy that all I have to do is ask questions um, <laughs> rather than have to compete with their expertise, but please join me in welcoming um, our panel to the stage and to Zoom. Okay, is this mic now on? That's perfect timing. Okay, so what we're going to do um, is we're going to have a panel discussion for about the next 40 minutes. Um, but then what we wanna do is open the floor and really hear from you of some of your questions about topics we might cover, as well as the ways that the things we talk about link to or, or build on some of the conversations that we heard about infrastructure and sort of the future of transportation from the undersecretary, and then all of the exciting work um, that's coming from Tesla in, in what Albert shares. So um, I'm just going to sort of, we'll bounce questions from panelists to panelists, but you all should feel free um, to chime in on any question. Oops, let me try this again. On any question um, that's asked, I'm gonna try to fasten this one more time. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. Okay, so when we talk about um, autonomous vehicles or AVs and transportation, you know, a number of types of design uh, come to mind. So we might talk about, just to give, kind of level the playing field for all of us, we could talk about things like driverless trucks. We've already heard those mentioned. They could be big or small. So they could be big rigs. They could be smaller delivery trucks. We could talk about passenger autonomous vehicles, whether they're privately owned or it's ride sharing. We could talk about small delivery robotics that are increasingly being incorporated into sort of the first mile, last mile of, of supply chains. We could talk about AVs that are used in warehouses. We could talk about autonomous um, technologies incorporated into public transportation. We could talk about both small and large um, drones and UAVs that get used in things like package delivery, infrastructure inspection, bridge inspections, and things like that, traffic monitoring. 
um, as well as what we're kind of beginning to see is real attention to thinking about larger drones um, that could get incorporated into cargo and passenger um, travel as well. So we have a lot of different use cases that we might talk about. So I'll, I'll have Tara sort of kick us off. So when we think about all these different kinds of AVs, um, what changes about our transportation systems, whether we're talking about moving goods or moving people, when we start to incorporate AVs? So what, what's really different about autonomous vehicles when we think about transportation? Well, they make driving, you know, easier and, and cheaper. So for you and me as, as traveling for personal reasons, uh, our value of travel time falls. We, we're less uh, cognizant of the time in the vehicle because we're not having to hold onto the steering wheel and basically avoid hitting everybody for 20 minutes or two hours, however long our trip is. And so we're bound to do more of it. We're also bound to leave the airlines uh, less business and, and stick to the ground more often um, because you can leave at any time, you can stop along the way and stretch your legs and there's uh, more freedom than going through a pair of airports and having to rent a car at the other end. And on the truck side, of course, uh, that, that driver can be a little less qualified, he or she can be sleeping and allowing for much longer uh, trip making and, and utilization of that asset and, and be there for the pickups and the drop-offs or in case there's a crash or something, if somebody else crashes into that, that truck. And so it brings down the cost of delivering people and, and freight, and that means more of it. And so when we simulated the whole Texas system, with a focus on the triangle, which is the, the Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth area, we estimate about 25% more vehicle miles traveled. And part of that comes from new users, right? People who are carless or, or, or cannot drive. Um, they may be 16 year olds or 15 year olds even, depending on how low we wanna go in permitting uh, use of these vehicles for on a you know a trip rental basis or eventually if if the price comes down of uh, you know households individually purchasing them so there's a lot of different use cases adding a lot of demand to the network long term mm -hmm. okay so we might start to see more travel um, but you also talked about we might kind of see the de-skilling or the reskilling of who's involved in logistics tra um, lo logistics transportation um, that the work might become also kind of less stressful. Uh, do you guys want to do you want to sort of jump in, Dave, to think about what might change, when we, particularly when we think about auto, uh, UAVs or drones? Yeah, and I think Kara touched on a little bit. I think the human capital changes uh, dramatically going from uh, crewed, whether it's surface transportation, airborne transportation, to uncrewed, mm -hmm. um, especially when you talk about things like intermodal transportation, and I think that's where a lot of this is gonna go, at least in the logistics field. It's not just about ground-based, it's not just about airborne and, and even seaborne and other, mm -hmm. other methods. It's really developing an inter -trans intermodal transportation system that covers all of those. So it's not just the individual technologies, but the transition technologies that get things from one to another. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that with even the Amazon folks uh, automating their warehouses, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things. So I think those things will eventually reduce the need for, for humans to be interactive. Uh, they may still require humans to be monitoring it. Mm -hmm. And we'll focus a lot of that human capital from the operation to the actual development mm -hmm. and looking at innovative ways to use those things in the future. So it will require a higher educational skill, a higher, you know, higher skill level for those types of people that are in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will reduce the overall cost and human capital, since that's typically a very large cost of any transportation system. I want to come back to this question of how do you create this intermodal system that you're talking about that really looks across different domains of autonomous systems. But if we think in big terms, and I'll, I'll have this question start with Dave as well. So what are some of the immediate um, and also longer term benefits of incorporating autonomous systems into transportation. So what, do, what do we gain when we bring AVs into existing transportation systems? A, a lot. I mean, efficiency, certainly, um, the carbon reduction, the possibility of that, um, reducing stress and, and uh, stress on humans in, in general. Mm -hmm. But I'll bring it back to logistics, right? Um, one of the things is it just reduces. Logistics chains 
it reduces the risk in the logistics chain. The logistics chains have been leaned out uh, over the past decade or a couple of decades significantly, so that time and predictability have become much more important than mm -hmm. they used to be by removing some of the, the stocking points along the way, or at least reducing the inventory levels. And I think we're seeing that now with some of the logistical challenges we're having mm -hmm. driven by the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. So being able to uh, have alternatives, uh, whether it's crude or uncrewed, uh, is important. Being able to automatically schedule these things through not manual means, but automated means increases the probability and the predictability. Um, maintenance is a huge issue, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit later, but mm -hmm. the maintaining these systems so they are reliable mm -hmm. is, is huge. And even if you're talking about maintaining the existing systems, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be the actual vehicles themselves, mm -hmm on a regular basis more, more easily, more frequently, and more thoroughly mm -hmm. so that you can predict mm -hmm. predict failure, corrective maintenance, actions, and those kinds of things. And, and autonomous vehicles add today, you know, this is one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand is you, know, you think of the Jetsons and everybody's flying around and all that kind of stuff in the future. Maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't. <laughs> but what we can do today are a lot of more localized things that have a huge impact on the current infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, for logistical systems. Mm -hmm. You know, things like monitoring bridges and inspecting uh, power grids that are very important. You know, power grid goes down, you know, you know maybe not, you know, that's not a direct impact to the overall logistics chain, mm -hmm. but it has a huge impact on mm -hmm. the logistics chain. Mm -hmm. So Andy, what, one of the things we heard um, from the undersecretary was in thinking about infrastructure were, was, the, was what happens to land use policy, land use, land use change when we start to think about other technologies. And so given your background in community planning and urban planning, do we <coughs> see any benefits to kind of land use, land use policies when we start to think about the incorporation of AVs um, into transportation systems or into logistics? Yeah, I think the potential benefits are really significant. Dave touched on this. It's, you know, there's a long list of potential benefits associated with these technologies and different applications, both existing technologies, things that are being used today, at least to some degree, things uh, related to operations, bridge inspection, pavement inspection, things like that. Um, certainly there are significant benefits there into migrating some aspect of responsibility over to these technologies. Um, but I think, you know, Dave touched on some, some challenges around existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think that relates particularly to transportation infrastructure, but also to the undersecretary's point about land use as well. So there's, uh, you know, obviously certain norms, laws, regulations, uh, issues of insurances and other things that we've spent generations getting used to with an mm -hmm. existing set of technologies and infrastructures. Now, Usually the conversation about autonomous systems, AI, deploying those technologies in the transportation space, we often end up talking about a desired end state. Mm -hmm. What does it look like deploying those technologies in a fully networked way? So in other words, oh, imagine a future where no one has to own their own vehicle. It's essentially autonomous mobility as a service. That's you know very. It's a very interesting, desired, potentially desired future state, and I think those benefits are clear. But what does it look like between now <laughs> and that desired yeah. future state? What does it look like when we have these technologies, old and new, commingling, um, and you know the regulations that have grown up around uh, the automobile and the systems that we know in the transportation space today? Uh, the manual of uniform traffic control devices, all of these things that have been built mm -hmm. across decades to suit a particular technology or set of technologies. How does that evolve? I mean, we've become so used to it, taking those things for granted, everything from uh, signage and how it's designed, how it's placed, mm -hmm. lane widths. So um, there are significant potential benefits. And in the land use space, we think about parking for sure. That's one that's an obvious uh, example especially in an urban context. You look at how much space is used for parking, particularly surface parking. If that's land that could then be reclaimed uh, and instead of being used for parking, used for more uh, economically contributing mm -hmm. active urban space, that's a big deal. That mm -hmm. affects communities in a significant way. Um, but I think there's a lot in yeah. this discussion that we're having today that's really interesting about what does it look like in the interim? 
And I want to come back to this issue of infrastructure when we talk about what are the kind of short-term and long-term barriers. But Cara, you, some of your work has really looked not only at the potential environmental benefits, but also the economic implications of incorporating AVs into transportation systems. So what do we know about, are there, are there economic gains in terms of thinking about incorporating these technologies? Yeah, huge, sizable gains. I, our value of time is worth, you know, maybe 15 to $20 an hour uh, for kind of the average American. And so not having to focus on commandeering that vehicle and, and, and sitting back and, and getting some work done or rest uh, it is very valuable to, to the, the user. So there's about a trillion dollars per year in savings for all the drivers um, under current conditions if they all were to switch to that kind of chauffeured model where they don't have to handle the vehicle. And so that's that's pretty sizable, but a lot of um, crash savings gains. We have about a trillion dollars a year, believe it or not. So about three thousand dollars per person per year in uh, crash costs. So lost productivity, um, property damage, you know, lost lives, of course. So, so pretty serious stuff going on. And uh, these vehicles have a lot of gains uh, to provide there. They also can have huge. Uh, economic impacts through land use changes. So land and property um, improvements on that land are a major piece of wealth and industry in this country. And so to the extent that they may cause more sprawl or hopefully more concentration, we, that is a question we do ask in each of the five or six different surveys we've now done nationally on, on the topic of how people's uh, behaviors will change under EVs. That's, that's pretty important as well to keep track of. Excellent, thank you. So we can think about the gains to our time, how do we price that, to the reconfiguration of land, particularly in cities and suburban areas. So we can start to think about all of these potential benefits, not to mention the environmental benefits that we, we've already talked a little bit about. But Andy, what might be um, some of the costs of, of that process of incorporating AVs into transportation systems. I think we heard from Albert that the average vehicle has a 17 year lifespan. Sometimes you hear people talk about 20. So we're talking about a long term transition here. But what do we know about some of the costs of, of turning to AVs in terms of workforce, changes to the built environment, liability? These kinds of sure. Things. Well, I mean, the workforce and workforce training component alone is significant. And pushing a faster evolution in what education and workforce training looks like. And that space is a very big deal. But as someone who works at a, an engineering firm <laughs> and does a lot of transportation planning and engineering, um, you know, it's, I think, really figuring out where the rub is in transitioning from transportation engineering and planning as we know it today. Um, and to hear from the undersecretary about, you know, having an aggressive approach to pushing a, an evolution there, I think is really important. But how do we make that evolution in a way where we're being mindful of all users? Mm -hmm. So this is an equity question for sure, but also how do we plan for communities? How do we plan for transportation networks when we have to plan, not just for the technology that we know and, and that we're used to, but these new technologies as they're being integrated in and develop regulations and standards that work for that technology uh, in a way that's safe so that we really can promote actual user adoption, which is a huge challenge at a community level. I'm sure we can talk more about that, but also making sure that those regulations are in place in a way that facilitates really safe operation of a, a rapidly evolving system. And to Cara's point, all sorts of impacts to the demand model mm -hmm. of what transportation looks like. New technologies are likely to induce some new demand. So how do our systems manage that? How do we plan for that? Um, you know, there's going to be a cost to that, a cost to society. Now, how does that net out with the, the potential benefits? That's something we still have to figure out. So Andy mentioned this idea of being um, mindful of all users. And so I'll kind of pose this to all three of you. Do we have a sense of are there... Um, groups or are there places that are more in danger of, of being left out or left behind when we when we think about the adoption of, of autonomous vehicles, particularly in the context of transportation? 
I think in the long run, no, but in the short run, perhaps. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll use some of the aviation uh, constructs to, as an example. It, it's much easier to get permission to fly drones from the FAA, who owns all the airspace and grants all permissions for anything that happens in that airspace in a rural environment mm. than it is today than in an urban environment. Um, and that's not for... Uh, unfairness reasons, it's for safety reasons. And a lot of the, 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 the procedures that'll be developed and the business cases that'll be developed will start in a more rural, less, po less densely populated area, will be proven out there, and then will evolve over time to urban, in, urban environments um, as appropriate. And some of them may never get there if, uh, you know, if the safety case can't be made and, and the regulator is satisfied that it's an appropriate mm. level of safety. Mm. Uh, so I think in the short term, it, it, there are going to be winners and losers. Mm. Uh, in the long term, I think some of the best benefits, even though they may be delayed, might accrue to sort of folks in the urban environment, for mm. example, because there's so much opportunity there mm. from a, you know, going from a, even go from a 2D <laughs> problem to a 3D problem once you get airborne mm -hmm. and you can fly, you know, air taxis and things like that. Mm -hmm. Huge opportunities there. Huge opportunities for avoiding congestion in those areas where you just don't have the space to build more roads, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the ultimate benefit will accrue, but it will take time to get there. Let Cara go next if she wants. Cara, do you want to jump in? Sure, sure. We just uh, put out a paper looking at vulnerable populations, uh, benefits and, and costs from access to shared autonomous electric vehicle or just shared autonomous vehicle fleets. Hopefully they'll be all electric because as we add this additional demand to the networks, which are already very congested, although we had a reprieve under COVID, as you as you probably noticed, at least in the downtowns. Um, that that kind of we can easily create gridlock with these vehicles you know they're smart but they don't fly um and so and of course the manufacturers want to be very cautious with the headways in between them um, because they don't want to have to shoulder that cost of a crash which will go to the deep pocket and since there is no driver uh you know there's no human driver the insurance responsibility is largely up to the manufacturer at that point so they're going to be driving very cautiously and um and hopefully avoiding you know crashes i think we're going to see like an 80 to 90 percent drop in crashes per mile traveled but we're going to see about a 25 percent increase in miles and we're going to see them coming in at a relatively high price um, for the private chauffeur mode uh, we really hope to see them doing ride sharing right away uh, but so cruise has started you know in the san francisco uh downtown area with these shuttles that open doors um, from the side. And so you just sit in them like you would at the airport, kind of in a in one of those uh, people movers, but a small six person holder. And then you go to the suburbs of Phoenix and you're seeing, you know, sort of middle class families and individuals um, being able to now grab a Waymo vehicle. Um, and I think Miami is starting up with Argo, which is part of Ford and Lyft handling uh, those connections but of course to get those connections generally you have to be banked you have to have a credit card you have to have credit a lot of low-income people don't have the wherewithal for that um, so th maybe they have a debit card and that gets used um, but it, it does get really tricky so uh, it would be nice you know the the cruise model that cruise approach in in downtown san francisco is is a nice one makes it a little bit easier having um, you know, sort of machines on on the sidewalk to help people who whose cell phones have run out of juice or who don't have you know um, a, a cellular plan. Is this these are expensive things to have monthly uh, on your bill. So we we hope that um, lower income people can access these things. Uh, it is a little bit harder for the persons with disabilities because of the ramps. That's an expensive, time consuming thing to to add to the system. But hopefully we'll continue to have paratransit and, and smarter paratransit where the person who's on board can actually help the traveler rather than not help them. They, they can only help them once they get to the vehicle in current paratransit system. So in a lot of ways, this could be a lot better, but we do need the price to come down and, and we do need to maintain some of those protections for the unbanked and for those with access uh, issues. I think Cara's right onto it there. I would just add that I think 
you know, talking about the community adoption part of this is also really important because um, as we sort of work through what equity and access looks like with this technology, um, if there is the feeling that this technology is only for some people, then I think that's going to create a lot of difficulty in terms of community adoption where people are saying, this technology is coming in, I don't know if I trust it, I don't know if it's safe, and now my neighborhood, my city, my community, we're being forced to, to take this on, and I'm never going to enjoy the benefits of that. So I think a part of the conversation here does have to be, what is the role of the private sector? What is the role of the public sector? And how do they interact in a way that certainly promotes equity of access, but also helps to manage um, issues of safety, issues of community adoption, community planning. I think one only has to look as far as the history of public transit, public transportation in the United States to understand that, um, that it can be a very challenging thing. So this is a perfect segue to talk about everybody's favorite topic, which is barriers to adoption. Um, but if I don't have time for it, I want one of you to ask Dave a question about drone delivery, because that, that's something that we hear a lot about. So if Absolutely. I forget it, it's your responsibility as an audience to ask him. Um, but maybe we'll, we'll, I'll throw this question out to the, to the three of you. We've heard about all of these amazing applications and uses of AVs and the, envir the, the environmental savings, the economic savings, the potentially increased mobility for all sorts of people. Um, one, of the, one of the number one examples often given for AVs is that they increase the mobility of older people who no longer are comfortable driving. So we know all these, these benefits, we know all of these ways they could expand. What, what are some of the barriers to widespread adoption of uh, autonomous vehicles in, in all of these contexts? Maybe I'll start this. Sure. Time. I think from, <laughs> from my perspective as a public policy person, I often think about this in terms of the technology evolving so much more quickly than our laws and our public policy making. So I think that is a barrier um, for, for communities and then nationally and globally what we do and how we do it. Um, I think there's an important role in you know, advancing this conversation in civil society so that the laws are there, the regulations are there, all, certainly to make people feel safe, to ensure safety, so the communities understand that there are real benefits to this and understanding what those benefits are. Um, but there's also thinking through the innovation of the, the technology and its deployment as well, understanding that you know, we often will have a dynamic uh, in the public policy space federally where the feds uh, will see that there is new technology and they sort of say to, to the private sector, hey, you know, go figure it out and uh, let us know what the regulations should look like. And I think there's a, a significant back and forth that should be had that's really healthy there. However, um, that completely hands-off approach or mostly hands-off approach doesn't necessarily encourage innovation either. There does need to be a framework, a structure in which that innovation mm -hmm. takes place. So I think uh, a significant role in dialogue between the public and private sectors is important mm -hmm. uh, to, to get through as a barrier, so to speak. And I think you're dead on, Andrew. The regulatory policy is a huge barrier, and I think it, it is that is happening at least you know from where we sit on the aviation side. Uh, but I'll, 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 a nuance to that is the compartmentalization of that those barriers within the government. So I'll give you a great example: the FAA, again, who owns all the airspace, and you have to ask Mother May I for any permission <laughs> to fly anywhere, pretty much. Uh, they just look at aviation safety. They don't look at overall safety. And uh, a great example, I think, that anybody can relate to is power line inspections. You know, you need to inspect high voltage power lines once, twice a year for lots of different things. They currently do it with manned helicopters and guys climbing, you know, people flying in poles. And that's it, it's one of the most dangerous, short of being launcher on the aircraft carrier, I think it's one of the most dangerous jobs that there are in the United States or in the world. Um, easily done by drones. Uh, to, uh, from a much safer standpoint, from an overall safety case, you know, people won't get hurt. You know, if the drone crashes into the power line, you lost the drone, no big deal, no harm, no foul. Uh, the FAA is currently allowing that, but only in a restricted area that's making it very economically challenging for for power companies to actually implement it with a positive benefit from their perspective economically. 
Um, there's absolutely no reason given where most of these power lines are in the middle of nowhere, forested lands, farmlands, whatever, to be able to allow them to do other things. But there is no one agency that looks at that holistically. You know? And so, it, so that, those are one of the things that, you know, real easy to fix if you could get them to talk to, get them to look at it from that, that way, but that's not the way they think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a nuance, but it's, I think, a, a, an important piece of it. So Cara, some of a lot of your work has looked at. Um, I'm no, I'm not sure where to look so that you know I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the screen in front of you, but I realize that you can't see that. Uh, so I'm looking at you now, Cara. And um, what is your you've you've spent a lot of time thinking about this issue of public perception. And Andy talked about community adoption, community. What are there barriers to um, to widespread adoption of these technologies associated? with public perception or, or, or public awareness of these technologies? Yeah, I think there's enough technologists in this country and in the big cities where these will be released that you'll have a lot of early adopters, especially at low speed. It's really hard to kill somebody inside a vehicle these days. Uh, you have to flip them, you have to keep them, you know, you have to hit, but outside the vehicle, of course, you can kill a pedestrian at 25 miles per hour, no problem. Um, you know, I think about 30% of people hit at that speed um, would suffer severely disabling injury or death. Um, so they're going to keep the, the speeds down. Um, and I think that'll encourage a lot of people to, to try it. And um, some people will be very regular users and they will know, they'll have a network of colleagues and friends and neighbors and relatives that will be um, pretty easily convinced in a relatively short time. Um, but of course you could also have some kind of terrible uh, crash situations uh, where a vehicle keeps driving with somebody underneath it and um, that's front page news. And it, you know, just like a kidnapping, a sensational story, it can really dampen enthusiasm, um, you know, at the policy level, even if the crash rates are half of what they would be otherwise. So it's it's a delicate balance um, for policymakers and the public, you know, to try to be reasonable. We haven't been very rational. Uh, many Americans have not been very rational with vaccines and COVID and masking. And, and so you can see that sort of backlash sometimes uh, very early in a, a new technology. But I think in, in terms of users, most people will be happy being inside them. And Frankly, being a pedestrian, you know, and having cars go by with tinted windows, I have no idea whether that driver sees me. So pedestrians are always on the defensive um, and, and cyclists too, if they're smart. Um, it's a, you know, a, a very vulnerable traveler, a uh, very soft traveler, very easy to harm with a 4,000 pound vehicle. So I, I do think though that these vehicles will have, you know, really good automated braking systems, better cameras than you and I have on our new vehicles. And, um, and, and probably, you know, protect those pedestrians better than you and I do. So I want to come back to this topic of infrastructure, because one of the things that autonomous systems of all sorts do is they produce tons of data and they are dependent on communication with infrastructure, with their environments. And so we were thinking about this big infrastructure bill. What are there, are there infrastructural barriers to widespread adoption? So this is another way of saying what would have to change about our current transportation infrastructure? Everything from the roads to the exit ramps to all of these. What has to change? Are there barriers to entry there? I don't think so. I hope I can take this one first, you guys. Um, you know, the manufacturers know that these trips go from door to door through a variety of settings. There's no way they're going to be protected all the way. So they've got to be able to travel through any kind of map setting, not off road, <laughs> but any kind of mapped public street setting and park safely. Um, so they, they absolutely are not betting on all the cities to update all their lane lines and um, have roadside devices. These are um, you know, really independent agents. And, and there is a threat of, of hacking and that kind of thing if you have any kind of external driver. But I do think that for, you know, crisis situations, they will dial in to a remote operator who can help get the vehicle out of a, a bizarre situation. Um, and so in those, that they'll break that that wall and allow for that communication in, in special situations. For, for the most part, the vehicle will be doing its own thing all the way. 
Um, and, and, you know, some in terms of private ownership, some um, owners would like to also have the, the wheel and some control at times. And so there may be an opportunity for the, the, the occupant to take over if it's a privately owned vehicle. Um, but those are going to be a, a little uh, longer, I, I, I guess, further out because the, it's a tricky thing for the manufacturer to hand a self-driving car over to a private operator who isn't really taking care of the sensors and everything. But, you know, Tesla, of course, is trying to, to do that evolution and uh, it scares the rest of the manufacturers quite a bit to, to hand the, the reins back and forth to a driver. So Car is optimistic that the manufacturers will produce vehicles that can handle the current infrastructure. What about you all? Equally optimistic? Uh, yes, I, I think the one thing I'll add to that is the, the kind of the question of who pays. And I'll go back to the, you know, the aviation industry from when it started was primarily funded by the government, all the infrastructure that was required, whether it was airports at local government levels, whether it was the air traffic control system at the federal level. Um, I'm not sure that's going to that model's going to work going forward. Um, certainly, the the government has kind of pushed back on it a little bit, and at least in the aviation space, and said, you know, you got you industry folks, you figure out what you need, you find a way to fund it. Um, so a little bit more analogous to maybe what the wireless communications yeah. model yeah, is, yeah. and what drives the wireless communication model is demand. And I used to work in a business that was a supplier to wireless communication, and they go through these spurts when. Okay, first it was phones, and then people figured out you could surf the internet with a wireless phone, and they had to basically redo the entire infrastructure, but there was demand there to pay for it, mm -hmm. so the users basically funded the system, and then, then people wanted to download videos and do TikTok, and there was another <laughs> explosion of infrastructure that happened, again, funded privately, mm -hmm. so I think we're going to have to figure out a way um, to get that you know, yes, the government has to invest to incentivize some of this stuff, not unlike what they did with electric vehicles and are doing with electric vehicles, mm -hmm. but they're not going to be able to afford to pay for all the new infrastructure that is going to be required over time. That's going to have, we're going to have to have a private business model, mm -hmm. perhaps a public-private partnership that yeah. supports that type of uh, development, because there will be over time. Which takes us back to Andy's point about the centrality of these conversations and dialogues and relationships between the public and the private sector if these, these technologies are to meet their potential. I think that's exactly right. I think that's the perfect demonstration of what that interaction across sectors is going to have to look like in some form. And I think, you know, technologically speaking, I think Cara's right that, and Dave's right that, um, you know, we have this existing infrastructure and I think it's reasonable to expect that the technology would, uh, would adapt to it instead of the other way around. But I think we also have to bear in mind that there, to some degree, we can predict what this technology is going to do, but only up to a point. Um, you know, future proofing was mentioned earlier. I think experience shows that that's only possible up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, completely future proofing any system is borderline impossible. It's, it won't be possible for us to anticipate every uh, impact associated with this developing technology. I think it's reasonable to expect that it will, it will adapt to what we have, but we're still trying to figure out how to fund and support traditional infrastructure in this country in a way that makes us globally, more globally competitive. Um, now we're integrating brand new technologies that are, I think you have to accelerate and modify the conversation to make good public policy and also sift through those questions about who pays, who, you know, what are the benefits to whom do they accrue and who pays for it? Right. And, I, and I think it, it, it won't be we scrap the old stuff and, and develop new stuff. I mean, to your point, Andrew, it will utilize the, the current infrastructure, but there will be incremental, perhaps, changes required to that. I think Kara hit on a few of those, even with, mm -hmm. the, with the self driving cars. You know, we have to augment things like striping and like other things. So, there, even though those may not be huge things, they are something that has to be addressed. and. You know, maybe in one location, it's not a big deal. You try and do it over the entire world and all like, you know, like COVID shots. Okay, I can do it. You can do it in the U.S., but what about everybody else? Mm -hmm. And how do you get there? So it will take time to get that far distributed. So speaking of time, we've got five more minutes. And my last question is, in fact, about time. So if we fast forward 10 years um, and we think about, you know, maybe the scaling up of things like drone delivery, we think of the, the fleets of AVs that, that CARA's research looks like. Maybe our cities are beginning to change as we incorporate um, AVs 
into our transportation systems. How will AVs have reshaped or influenced something like our supply chains or transportation systems if we fast forward 10 years? Will we see big changes? And the good news is if we're right or wrong, we won't have to be here. We won't have to be in this room. <laughs> yeah. I hope to be alive in 10 years. I, I think it will. Uh, I think it will change dramatically. Again, I go back to the, some of the reliability and alternatives that it offers. Again, I don't think the Jetsons model is is by any stretch ten years out. It's you know if it's if it's anything, it's quite a bit further out than that. But people will start to become accustomed to you know now when a drone flies by your house, it's an anomaly. It's kind of oh cool you know it's like when I was a kid and saw my first helicopter, it was like wow I've never seen one of those before. And I think people are like that with drones. It will become an, a common occurrence. You're already seeing even in the delivery space. Uh, certain niche parts of the market where it makes sense getting approvals to do it. You know, medical delivery where time is critical, where you can't afford to wait in a traffic jam somewhere just because you have to, have to deliver this medication at five o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. Um, you know, those kinds of things, those kinds of applications will get approved. They're, they're going to be economically beneficial as well as socially beneficial, and therefore they will get done fast. But as far as jumping in your your uh, autopilot air taxi, uh, I'm not sure that'll happen in 10 years. That might be a little bit further down the road. Well, I, I'll, I'll uh, just jump in there to say that 10 years is, um, I think it's hard to say what'll happen in 10 years. I, I do know that as we think about these conversations in terms of the Jetsons and flying cars, I think obviously a lot of these technologies they've developed quickly, but they haven't developed that quickly. But as we've seen with a lot of technologies, as particularly as we talk about things like AI and quantum computing, um, you know, it might feel like we're on a gradual slope, but that can change at any time as we think about the exponential rate of growth mm -hmm. with certain technologies, relevant technologies to this conversation. So, um, you know, I'd say buckle up. It's going <laughs> to, it's going to get pretty wild and probably sooner than we think. All right, you get the last word, 10 years from now. How will, what will things look like? Well, I hope our ports are working properly at that point. I understand they're very <laughs> congested right now. And um, yeah, I hope that countries are getting along and the trade patterns are calm. And um, so there's a lot of uncertainty in those areas. Um, but yeah, we could use maybe more automation at ports. Um, and I think, you know, more people will be accustomed to purchasing things online. So there'll be fewer trips of people back and forth to stores, but you know, I'm not sure how much the supply chains will, will change. Um, trucking you know, will continue to dominate the high value goods movement for its door to door. And, uh, but rail will get better. You know, I, I think uh, they are continuing to add some innovations and double, if not triple tracking. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see, but I, I don't forget, I forecast anything too, uh, you know, too different. I, I hope to not see a lot of drones crossing my skies. Um, maybe with blood shipment, that's okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I do think it, it could be um, a pretty, ugly future if you've got a lot of things in the airspace above your, your home and your businesses. Um, but yeah, the ground is obviously a very busy place. And if we make better use of the ground infrastructure by sharing rides, thanks to congestion pricing and um, certainly much higher gas taxes, they haven't come up in 30 years in most states. I think Pennsylvania, Washington, and California are the leaders in this country, but the, the federal gas tax hasn't gone up in over 30 years. It's just this third rail of politics. Um, it's very sad and frustrating uh, because we really need much more efficient vehicles on the road and we need people to try to dampen their lust for, for driving uh, petroleum fueled vehicles long distances um, across this big country of ours. Um, so I'd love to see more efficient choices being made. So I want to give our panelists a big hand, but first, before uh, I'm doing this in reverse order, I just realized what I really want to do is open up the floor for any questions you have. Gary, we probably have, what, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, a couple, yeah, about 10 minutes, maybe. 10 minutes, okay. So does anybody have any questions for our sure. panelists? Here's a question. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the issue of, and I guess I'd like uh, input from uh, each of you or sign out if there's any consensus. When do you envision 
that uh, uh, EV trucking, you know, autonomous trucking will be commonly used on the, on the roads. Well, autonomous, mm -hmm. autonomous. I'm sorry. I might be the least qualified to answer, but I'll just start by saying <laughs> that I, as you know, the public policy I'll voice, take issue with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's fair to say the technology is, if not there, very close, nearly there. I think it's, in what way is it deployed? How is it deployed? How is it regulated? How, how are communities, whether it's, uh, a federal level conversation or at the state level or even a local level, how is it further deployed in a test environment that people feel is safe? I think it's all in that essentially community-based human level conversation. The technology arguably could do it now, um, but how is it done in a way that's safe and that people are going to feel is safe um, that gets us a little closer to deploying it at scale, which is where the impact really lives. Well, I agree with your assessment, but uh, I also asked, uh, when do you think it might happen? <laughs> <laughs> Ask uh, the insurance companies. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sure, but I don't know if there's any common thinking. We're going to see this in uh, five years. I'll 10 let years. Dave and Carr answer. Yeah, that part. I'll give you an analogy. I mean, because I'm I'm not a ground-based guy. I'm an airborne guy, but. Um, you know, what we see in the near future for drone delivery is it's going to first happen, and again, a time frame, we can all have our own opinion. It's going to first happen on fixed routes where you're going, you know, it, it's, you know, not just I need to go from point A to point X and I don't know where X is, you tell me and I'll go, but routes that are, routes that are heavily regulated, you know, take the throughway, for example. You know, those kinds of highways, which are not heavily, well, they're heavily traveled, but they're not heavily congested typically, I think will be the first places you see those types of, of deliveries happening. You know, we're certainly seeing it in drone deliveries where, you know, it, uh, we have a customer that, that runs a pharmacy and every day, two, three times a day, they go deliver pharmaceuticals to care homes. Same route, same thing every day, even on weekends. Those kind of routes are things where it's going to be economically more beneficial to the folks if they have to do development of infrastructure, they have to go through the process of getting the regulators comfortable with what's happening. Those will happen first. As regulators get more comfortable with those and the safety levels and the technology advances as well to give them the safety levels that they need, you'll start to see it more ubiquitously. So yeah, I'm going to say five years just to answer your question. And I, I might add that I, from what I understand it, on um, non-public roads, uh, like mining roads and other uh, long stretches of Australia, they've had self-driving convoys um, and, or at least the following vehicles were, were self-driving for many years. And, and China and other places um, off public roads and then on public roads may, may lead. Um, you know, by fiat, they, they, you know, there's just, uh, there's not a democratic process going on. And, and so um, they just decide this makes great sense and, and they move forward quickly. And so it may be more common in other countries than it is here. And it, it really depends where you are uh, in, in the nation and whether you'll see one of those vehicles. Um, just like as a traveler, if you go into San Francisco or New York or maybe Portland and Austin and Miami, you're more likely to be able to be picked up by a self-driving taxi, you know, uh, basically an Uber or Lyft type vehicle ride sharing than you would be in many other cities. They just, they don't produce enough of them. They don't have enough experience managing the fleets that they want to kind of grow that before uh, they deploy at large scale. And of course the, the manufacturing is still going to be a bottleneck for them in, in producing at scale. My, uh, thank you. My second question relates to uh, kind of the economic impact when uh, there's autonomous vehicles, using the example of trucks, uh, moving from the West Coast to the East Coast. You know, you compare that with a train that goes from the West Coast to the East Coast, and the truck, let me just make a reasonable equivalent. You maybe have 200 truck equivalents on, a, on an intermodal train. When you no longer need drivers on those trucks, you've eliminated 200 people and big shift in the economic model uh, of trucking. For the train, you get rid of two people 
uh, on the train. So there could be a big economic shift, which could drive more business to be moving on the highways versus on the rail system, which would be one of those unintended consequences, I believe. Um, so I just wanted to tee that up to get anybody's reaction, maybe on the policy side, the, you know, be the bigger issue than I think the technology is, uh, is gonna answer for itself. And we've simulated the shift in trade for the nation with a uh, less expensive trucking and not everybody shifts who's using trucks, but the longer distance uh, flows under our different price scenarios did shift um, and, and they did pull away some of the market share from rail, but um, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a, a simple thing and I don't think that they will remove an operator from that expensive asset, you know, this is a $100,000, $200,000 perhaps vehicle. So uh, it, it, it's probably smart to keep a human on board um, in case something happens, a tire blows out, another vehicle hits you. You also have to do pick up and drop off, but you can sleep or you can do administrative tasks for your company, or you can have a second job en route. You're just kind of a shepherd there to look after the flock of freight as it moves uh, eastward. And uh, so there, it's a, you know, it'll save money. I just don't think it'll save you 30% off the top, but it will allow you to go much farther under the work, um, hours of work and hours of service rules that we have uh, for those, those drivers. Hey, so my question is kind of jumps off that one a little bit. Um, so you all were talking about land use and the future ideal scenario for autonomous vehicles, which is, as many people as possible sharing these vehicles to go from point A to point B. Um, and I, I, I think that's a great you know, future goal as well, but you know, unfortunately there's another reality where um, that might, that's just as likely where every person owns their own autonomous vehicle. Um, so you could say they're all gonna be electric, you could say all these things, but uh, that still would uh, incentivize these st st sprawl and bad land uses um, so how do you reconcile these two things and what do you think is the answer to, you know, combat that? Pricing. So really, we've had congestion for a long time. It's just been a, kind of expensive and difficult to price away congestion and, and legislatively also difficult. If we can't raise the gas tax, we're like... Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, I mean, we, we, we hardly tax that hazardous material. And so pricing the roadways is even trickier for our legislators in many cases. Um, but it, I recommend credit-based congestion pricing to give people an incentive to make smarter decisions in those credits, maybe $40 a month um, per adult in the region can be used for transit and for e-bike rentals or even an e-bike purchase or something um, if you save up your credits. But they have to be used locally so you can't cash them out. Pretend you're living in the region when you're really off in Europe or something for the month. And uh, yeah, you have to create you know, an environment where people see a real price signal rather than sitting in a long queue of vehicles, You know, everybody reading their phone because they're all in these self-driving vehicles, get them to fill those seats and uh, save money right off the top, but also en route um, with the tolls. So I, I think that's really the only way to kind of rein that, that genie back into the bottle. And, and we released it a long time ago. We, we, it's just hard to price roadways, but we've now got such smart vehicles and GPS um, that you will let the vehicle keep track of its own tab. And every time it passes a gantry, it can um, be interrogated for what its current account uh, debit is, and that can be reconciled and it can be randomly audited as well. Yeah, I'll say one, two, two points. One is, I don't think it'll be an either or. I think it's going to continue to be a mix. There's, um, you know, now what that proportion is will depend on a lot of things. And that's to the second point, which is never underestimate the, the power of businesses or individuals to optimize the cost equation, because that's what they'll do. Um, at the end of the day, most people will go with what's best for them in their situation. You know, everybody's situation is somewhat different. Every company's situation is somewhat different. So, um, you know, to the point on long-term trucking rail versus, you know, for long-term trucking rail makes a huge sense. You know, I, I heard the statistic, you can get 400 miles a gallon or equivalent of 400 miles a gallon on a, you put something on a train versus drive it on a truck. 
Um, so even EVs are gonna have to come a long way to compete with 400 miles on a gallon of gas or the equivalent of a gallon of gas. But short haul, you know, they make a different, it's a totally different calculus and they will make a different decision based on a different situation, but they will always optimize the price of pay or the cost of pay So, Which I'll try and make very quick because you, you folks have done a really good job with the gating issues. Um, a little different for commercial motor vehicles. Um, current technology does not do well in rain or snow, for example. And, you know, they don't have that problem in your state of Texas, which is why they test there. <laughs> so my question becomes, we have this push-pull in the ecosystem, which is very simply, um, technologists, companies like trying to come up with technology that fixes things like that, and the investment community who want these things out as quickly as possible. And when you look at the multi-million dollar investments in companies like Aurora, those aren't being put in by PEs and VCs um, to wait 10 or 20 years. So how do we balance the need for returns against the need for safety? Well, I'd, of course I'm gonna say in part, it's a public policy discussion, but I also think they go hand in hand. I think economic pressure is created by those safety issues and say, concerns of safety are gonna be tied to the economics and the, the market demand around these technologies. I, I, don't see, I don't see a high level of adoption associated with these technologies unless those safety questions can really be fully answered. In fact, we've already seen that with the deployment of some of these technologies, even with an extremely high rate of success, um, even the occasional accident sets, sets the timeline way back on the development of technology, which I, and I'm not saying that's inappropriate. I think the safety concerns are paramount in adoption. And I think that's in part what marries the safety concern and the market concern. And the public perception is huge, right? I mean, the, the, old, the old adage in the aviation industry is you're about a hundred times more likely to die on your way to the airport than you are getting on the plane and flying to wherever you're going. The, the public is scared to death to fly, but they don't jump in their car at a moment's notice and drive wherever. So it, that those kinds of educational processes, I mean, it's not sensational when, when a car accident happens and somebody dies, but it's very sensational when a plane crashes and people don't even die. The other day, you know, that plane crashed and everybody survived. It was made the front page of the paper. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big issue too, as big as the public policy. And, and one of the things we're working on is how do we educate folks about the overall risk assessment here when we're talking about safety, because it is about that. It's not about any one aspect of it. So I'll end with an anecdote that builds on this about the link between safety, public perception, and education. One of the most interesting things I've seen recently is a car company in Detroit that put an exhibition about autonomous vehicles in the local children's science museum, because they have realized that the audience that they want, are most interested in convincing about these vehicles, they're six and seven right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought that was so astute to, to start at that age in terms of socializing the next generation to think about this as a viable, as a viable option. So I wanna give a big round of applause to our panelists. They're all busy and in very high demand. And I just wanna say thank you to all three of you for coming um, and participating in this really robust um, and interesting conversation about where technology is going around autonomous vehicles and how that intersects with these questions about supply chains. Um, which sets us up for our next panel. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Great thank you for participating in our program today. That's terrific, a great discussion. And with that, we'd like to get our second panel up and get them all mic'd up and ready to go. Thank you all very much. Okay, everyone, we'll get uh, started with our second panel discussion. And um, if you've not heard any news about um, any supply chain issues this past year, <laughs> then you've either been hiding out in a cave or you've just come out of a coma. Um, it literally is multiple times a day, every single day. Uh, the evening news, uh, if you get any kind of a subscription to a, an online trade journal, it's multiple times a day, uh, supply chain issues. And so I think it's gonna be a great panel discussion to talk about these issues. Um, where they come from, where they're going. And I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Paul Svinland, who's the CEO of FTG Logistics. 
and uh, alum of Syracuse University as well. And I'll let Paul introduce his panel. Thank you, Gary. So uh, I think this will be a nice pivot from the uh, previous topic, right? That was talking about automation, uh, autonomous vehicles, and that's the future, right? Our topic is gonna be about what's happening right now today that we're all experiencing, right? Um, you turn on CNN, uh, CNBC, no one knew what supply chain was a year ago. Now everybody knows what supply chain is, right? Uh, again, I graduated in 1993. I was a transportation distribution management and operations management major, which I guess today they would call supply chain major. No one had any clue what I was doing or, or what I was going to do. Now it's crystal clear. It's front and center, you know, front page news. And uh, I think it's about time, quite honestly, that uh, it got the attention and the visibility that it so deserves. It's just a shame that it took a pandemic to get that attention, right? Um, so with that, we're, our topic is transportation logistics challenges um, during a global pandemic. And so I'd like to, to introduce my all-star cast uh, or panelist. I mean, this is top notch. We have over hundred years of experience behind me. Um, very impressive. And so I'm going to read their bio. So it's going to be a little bit lengthy, but I think it's re very relevant and very important because you need to understand who these people are and their background and how qualified they are to talk about the issues that we're going to talk about today. So I'll go from left to right. So first is Farouk Bazaar. Uh, he is Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer uh, at CSX, and he's been there since May 2019. Prior to joining CSX, uh, Farouk was Managing Partner at Linwood Partners a transportation logistics advisory firm he founded in 2017. Farouk, previous executive experience includes senior, senior leadership roles within transportation logistics functions at Clarendon, Booz Allen Hamilton, AT, and AT Kearney. Farouk holds an MBA in management, marketing and transportation from Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern University and a bachelor's degree in economics and political science also from Northwestern. And that's J.L. Kellogg, excuse me, Farouk. Uh, second, we have Beth Ann Rooney, and Beth Ann is the Deputy Director of the Port Department of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the nation's third largest port behind Long Beach and Los Angeles, I'm assuming, yep. correct? Okay. Um, she is responsible for managing the day-to-day -day administration and operations function of the port, including facility management, infrastructure, planning, environmental sustainability, port efficiency, business development, finance, and human resources. You're a busy person. Um, she was named to the position in April 2019 after serving four and a half years as Port Assistant Director, Strategy and Innovation. A 30-year veteran in the maritime industry, she is a graduate of the State University of New York Maritime College with a Master's in International Transportation and a bachelor, Bachelor's in Marine Transportation with qualifications as a third mate. Ms. Rooney holds several professional certifications and is an accredited Marine Port Executive from the International Association of Maritime and Port Executives. Next, we have Tim Nolan. Tim Nolan assumed the role of President and CEO of TOTE in July of 2018, TOTE Maritime. He joined TOTE uh, in April 2013 as the Executive Vice President and was promoted to President in January of 14. He brings more than 20 years of experience in the transportation logistics industry. Prior to joining TOTE Maritime, Tim served as the Senior Vice President of the International Division of USIN Logistics America, formerly NYK. In this role, he was responsible for 20 offices, including the Ocean, Custom House Brokerage, Mexico Cross Border, and Supply Chain Solution Division. Tim began his career with AP Muller Maersk organization in 1994. We actually worked together. Uh, he holds a bachelor and master's degree from St. Joseph University in Philadelphia. And then finally, our final panelist, Dave Browering, is president of non-asset-based logistics with NFI and has over two decades of experience within the 3PL space. Through that time, he has developed an expertise in creating fast growing and efficient tech enabled operations focused on customer service and execution. As president, Dave leads the brokerage, intermodal, global freight forwarding, and 4PL services at NFI, one of the largest privately held and family owned 3PLs in the US. By combining his upbringing at American Backhaulers and CH Robinson with his blend of technology and operational ex execution, Dave's non-asset division continues to be one of the fastest growing division within NFI. So I think most importantly, you have four individuals who are in the trenches, working the supply chain, involved in, on, in this stuff on a daily basis. So I, I think they're very well qualified to, to discuss 
uh, what we're about to discuss, which is really dealing with this pandemic and, and the issues it's had on supply chain. So with that, I'm gonna move over and I'm gonna start moderating. All right, this is comfy. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, with Beth Ann, and um, it's almost been two years, right, since the first case of COVID was identified. Really, it was December uh, in, in, in Wuhan in, in China back in 2019. When did your organization first become aware of the virus, and what was the initial reaction? You know, interestingly, I, I was in a meeting uh, with our Office of Medical uh, Services, our director, uh, uh, a physician, in December, you know, when it first became an issue overseas. And we started talking about a pandemic uh, and the pandemic plans that the Port Authority has and, you know, what would we do and, and how would we execute them. So as an agency that is not just running uh, New York and New Jersey's ports, but uh, airports, tunnels, bridges, bus terminals, a rapid rail system, the World Trade Center complex, um, all modes of transportation are, are a Port Authority asset within the New York, New Jersey region. So we started in December uh, preparing for the just in case it was actually gonna hit us. I'll tell you the Office of Medical uh, Services and the Port Authority didn't think it was gonna come to us. Uh, we were preparing, you know, we were all kind of <laughs> laughing about it at the time, uh, but you know, joke's on us. <laughs> Yeah. David, your thoughts? So <clears throat> because we're a global freight forwarding organization, we began to hear about it in mid late January as it became uh, an, a factor for the outbound shipments coming out of Asia. Uh, for us, it was more about contingency planning for systems management, protecting employees, figuring out how we we're going to get PPE to people that were you know, really on the ground in the front lines. We have 3,000 trucks running around the country. We have over 200 warehousing locations, 15,000 employees that are mostly on the front lines of the supply chain. And I, like, uh, like you, we didn't really believe that it was real. And in quite in fact, we had several conversations where I was advocating for a little bit more action on our office workers to just put them home, do contingency testing. And it took us four to six weeks to really believe that it was going to settle in to be reality. Farouk? <clears throat> yep. <laughs> well, uh, simil similar response to David, you know, so we, um, our company probably became most aware of, uh, of um, the coronavirus in January of 2020. And uh, we began planning, I'd say later that month, really around protecting critical infrastructure. And for us, that's our operations center, which is really the kind of brains uh, of the railroad, which is in Jacksonville. So taking measures there. And then similar, we have 19,000 employees operating 22 states. So thinking first and foremost about um, the health and safety of our employees and without compromising uh, safety at the railroad. Now our business, I would say, wasn't really impacted much until late March. You know, we're one of the two um, Eastern railroads. So our network is east of the Mississippi east of the Mississippi. And since, um, you know, the early beginnings of, uh, of coronavirus were really in, in Asia and you saw more impact coming out of the Western U.S., I would say our business didn't really get impacted until late March. And then, of course, very impacted in the second quarter. Right. Mr. Nolan? Yeah, thanks, Paul. <laughs> the, um, you know, Paul was on the radar from what you saw in Asia taking place at end of 19. Um, and then early in January, in February, we have an office based in Seattle. So once some of the nursing homes started getting impacted up there, really became a little more prevalent to us. And then it was uh, beginning of March. Folks may remember it was March 8th. And I remember I'm based in Jacksonville, Florida. And during that week, they have a big golf tournament called the Players. And it was that week. Usually it's the biggest turnout in town for the year. Um, Surprisingly, it's not the Jacksonville Jaguars. It's the biggest turnout. So, but uh, it's the biggest turnout of the year there. And the first day uh, I went, you could tell there's a third attendance there. And by the beginning of the second day, the tournament had been canceled. That's really when reality set in. Fortunately, some of the others, we started doing some business continuity planning. 
Um, we were fortunate to have uh, practices in place as we service the uh, Caribbean with our ships. So from hurricanes of having to have business continuity in Florida, we're able to utilize that again. But for us, very similar to others, uh, we have a thousand mariners, 600 folks that work, work on the waterfront at the terminals, another 600 you know, in the offices. Uh, it was really about their safety. Uh, their frontline workers, specifically on the terminals and on the ships. How do we ensure the safety of the mariners? So the ships that we operate are able to get to Alaska to serve uh, the community there, and likewise into Puerto Rico and into some of the other islands to serve them safely. Um, so for us, that was a core uh, critical point for us. And then you went into managing the business on top of it. How is the impact really going to hit the company? You know, focus on some of the financials, focus on the well-being of the teams, making sure you're over-communicating more than what you usually would do. Because um, you really didn't know what the next steps were and what the impacts could be. So it was really pivoting day by day, week by week at that time. But coming back to your original question, it was that week of March 8th where really the rubber hit the road. And it was that following Monday where we went remote and we've been remote ever since. So um, thank you. Um, so from my perspective, right, January, February, and March, the volumes are still still existing, relatively normal levels, let's say, right? Then all of a sudden in April, you start to see fall off, May, a little bit more, June, a little bit more, and then maybe like in July, I might be off a month or two, it's 18 months ago, but then July, it starts to level out and kind of bottom out. Then all of a sudden it starts to pick back up. And I would say kind of across the board, right, in each mode of transportation may be a little bit different from a time perspective. But in general terms, it kind of declined pretty hard, but then it kind of spiked and it spiked back up like hard. And to the point where far harder than I think any one of us ever expected. Everybody says, you know, when are you, when were you at pre-COVID levels? Because now we're far above that. So with that, how, how have you dealt with the heightened volumes and, and, the, and, and the bottlenecks that they created throughout the supply chain in this country, right? Because we're, we're at unprecedented levels, right? So Tim, I'll start with you. You know, Paul, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's kind of when the softness took place to when it kind of rebounded, which was end of June to July for us. And really where we've experienced it has been, uh, you know, of course, space on the ships has been one element of it. Um, we have not seen as much in some of the larger ports for the fact that we lease a lot of the property for our terminals in the, the core areas that we call. Um, however, there's been congestion. So let's say it's been on equipment. Our dwell times have more than doubled. We measure equipment outside our terminals over five days. Dwell time is more doubled on equipment. While volumes have been up, the equipment's not only dwelling because of volume being up, it's because of Customers holding on longer at their warehouses. It's now warehousing space for them that's overflow from what they could handle. So equipment's been a big uh, challenge for us. Traditionally, every year we'll bring in new assets, off-hire other assets. We haven't been able to off-hire anything. Fortunately, we've been able to bring in new, but not off-hire. In addition, you would say the trucking capacity has been a big uh, impact for us. Um, we used to work, let's say, with a half a dozen core truckers in our markets. We now work with at least a dozen in each one of our core markets. And even at times with that, we're struggling to make sure we cover capacity. Um, it's chassis, but truckers in particular are some of the core elements for us. Um, when I come back to equipment, how are we managing some of the equipment? We, we implemented GPS on the majority of our equipment a few years back. This initially was a sell point, one for customers on tracking and tracing, um, but it also quickly came into us managing our efficiencies and our fleet size. We were able to target and work with customers who have that extended well, and you then start working on allocations. And it's, it's unfortunate you have to get to those levels, but those are some of the key points we had to get to. In addition, on the terminal side, we've had extended gate hours. Uh, gate terminals may be open early morning to you know, ship departure, let's say at 1800 um, in a given day, we'll be opening at four in the morning. We'll keep them open even after the ship leaves to get further cargo in for the next vessels that'll be coming in. So it's, it's been an increase in the workload, increase in cost, which will, touch on it sometime today. Uh, those are some of the elements that we've focused on with the challenges and strains we've had. Autonomous trucks can't come soon enough, can they? I hear you on that. David? Uh, I don't even know where to start. Uh, <laughs> logistics whack-a-mole. Uh, it's been, you know, right after the 
reacceleration of the market, you know, there was this, I, I said, it's a lot, it was a lot like trying to play chess plan, blind, uh, blindfolded. Um, the, because industrial production had been shut down, industrial production makes up 40% of the ton miles driven in the United States. So it was a major impact to the trucking community, specific domestic truckload community, and LTL for that matter, because it's very heavily industrial focused. So there were all these carriers sort of scrambling to the places where there were excess. So, you know, they were moving toilet paper and they're moving disinfectant and there. And then everything started to turn back on, but not in the same way that it was before. So the pieces didn't quite fit back in the right place. And as the year accelerated, you had these issues with drivers who were, you know, older on average that had left the market, weren't willing to come back because they were exposed. So you have real supply constraints and real true supply constraints that, it was probably the first time for sure in my 25 years where it had not been a demand driven constrained market where it was truly there were not enough trucks driving on the road to actually move the goods that we needed to move or that the consumers wanted and as and stimulus piled on and consumers started to behave differently and consumption accelerated we were holding our own through the end of the year and then the polar vortex hit texas in february and it sort of spun everything out of control and it it melted the, or froze the infrastructure, sorry, wrong, wrong mm -hmm. term. Uh, you know, rail networks were completely locked up in certain markets, which was unheard of. I mean, it, BNSF shut down three inter, intermodal terminals, which had never happened before. And if since then, it's just sort of been trying to allocate as fairly as possible, trying to find the right places to serve the people that you've served. Um, you know, I can tell you that one of the little uh, to, to not talk about all the bad we had the best mpgs we ever had in the history of our trucking company last year because of less traffic mm -hmm. we know that we were a better environmentally safer company last year because there was less traffic so like there are these little things that were out there but for us it's just been trying to find the path of least resistance and 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 that path is different almost every single week and trying to support as many people as we can support through that Baruch? Yeah. So um, your question was how are we kind of dealing with the unprecedented uh, yeah, the demand? So, 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 so I would say not great, right? And I, and I think, um, and I'll say that for a couple of reasons is, you know, unlike a lot of other businesses, um, you know, our business is not back to where it was pre-COVID. And I'd say for two reasons, you know, some of it is, you know, Tim went through it, you know, we are sort of at the mercy of the supply chain, right? You know, chassis, boxes, what's going on in the port in LA, Long Beach in particular, but it's impacting the Eastern ports now also. Semiconductor shortages. So, you know, given all the different businesses we serve, primarily automotive, but um, but steel and, and so forth. So, um, and then some self-inflicted, right? Um, you know, as a railroad and one that went through a, a major operations transformation in 2017 and 2018, um, we're just a leaner company uh, than we were historically. And, um, you know, when you run that lean and you go through um, something unprecedented like we did, and of course, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the other companies, but when the pandemic hit, because to your point, uh, you know, so many businesses went away like that. Automotive demand shut down, right? You know, the automotive plants were down for what, six weeks. Um, you know, we furloughed people, we cut. So we were dealing with an even... Uh, lower level of workforce. And um, just as quickly as things diminished, they picked back up in June, July, August of, of last year. And we weren't prepared from a, from a people perspective. We didn't call back people quickly enough um, and people haven't come back. And, you know, again, you'd have to be living under a rock if you didn't know that there are major challenges around workforce right now. And we're proud, you know, we're very directly impacted by that. Um, you know, I don't know through the you know, experience of COVID, if similar to long haul truckers, if people have had an epiphany and realized that being a train conductor and working out in the physical infrastructure of a railroad puts you in harm's way to um, getting sick, getting hurt, possibly, um, possibly dying, and people just haven't come back yet. Um, how much of that is tied to some of the stimulus money and the entitlements? We're not sure. Those are now, you know, gone for now, and maybe they'll bleed through the rest of the year and probably we'll have a good picture in I would say February of next year, but you know, we're still not back to the levels that we were at. You know, we find we're managing our business um, to the capacity that we have. 
And you know that's frustrating for us. It's frustrating for our customers because we're not serving them as well as we as we were uh, two years ago. But we hope to get back to those levels um, early into 2020. Well, I'm not going to answer your actual question, but I'm going to put a little context into what my colleagues have, have shared in terms of the actual on the ground impacts. So, you know, you talked about the steep decline and an even steeper, you know, increase in cargo. For the Port of New York and New Jersey, our volumes were as, as much as 45% below the previous year. And then we spiked up to 65% above the previous year. So in that trough, when everybody else was, you know, laying off and, you know, warehouses, right, there's so many other aspects of the supply chain than what's, than what's sitting here. Uh, warehouses and distribution centers uh, laid off in, in just vast quantities. So when that volume picked up, those, those people were greatly benefiting from the stimulus, and they did not start to come back to work until a couple of weeks ago when the stimulus all came to an end. So, you know, there's truckers, the truck shortage supply that is pulling the boxes out of the marine terminals. That's one leg. Then once the boxes are stripped of their cargo in the warehouses and distribution centers, then we need a domestic truck to bring the cargo to a retail store or to a, to a fulfillment uh, center. So those fluctuations in cargo and are, are very difficult for anybody to handle. Uh, now, when you then go into 2021 and you go around the United States to all of the major gateway ports, New York, New Jersey, Norfolk, Savannah, Houston, LA, Long Beach, uh, Seattle, Tacoma, each one of us is experiencing between 25 to 30% growth year over year. And last year, despite those crazy volumes, was a record for all of us. So the entire supply chain hasn't had the time and the ability to build up the capacity to handle a 30% increase in cargo. So why are we experiencing the congestion throughout the supply chain that we are? Those, those sharp increases in volume without the ability to actually prepare for it. And then you question, you know, would you prepare for it? You know, as asset owners, you know, you, you can't possibly, you know, build, build yourself out of a problem that is temporary because the volumes are going to drop. The, that overconsumption that we are buying stuff more than we're uh, paying for services. The shippers that are replenishing their inventory from when production was shut down and the shippers that are bringing in sometimes two and three times the volume that they normally bring in just in case, just in case production shuts down you know, overseas again. Vietnam is shut down right now. 80% of their factories are shut and they don't expect to reopen until January. So if you hadn't stocked up as somebody who's buying from Vietnam, you're SOL you know, until not just January, until March by the time it gets there. So uh, it, it's, it, it's just a, an untenable situation uh, for any of the businesses in the supply chain to actually handle those fluctuations and then prepare for such a spike in, in volume in 2021. So you, you, you mentioned a couple of things and to me, I think it's very interesting. There, there used to be near shoring, right? And just in time. I like to think that near shoring is now going to be near storing and just in case to your point earlier, right? And those two things, it's, it's, it's going to have a ripple effect on the supply chain. It's going to change how we do business and how we behave for, for the next bunch of years. Um, so Dave, Farouk and, and Beth Ann talked about um, the labor issues. What, what are you experiencing at NFI? I mean, one, what, what do you think was the cause of it and how come people haven't come back sooner? What, what, what you know, I don't want to get too political here, but but what do you think is behind it? And what do you think it's going to take to fix it? So I'll start with the headline, which is that we have 2,700 open jobs today. What's typical? 500. And almost all of those are in the warehouse. So the, the big challenge is, in my personal opinion, is that people have been voting with their wallets. 
And they're saying now that that job is officially not worth that pay. And we have increased pay in, and you think about it, the barest basic minimum wage, uh, you know, basic minimum wage labor, you know, breaking containers, manual lumping of, of boxes. Those wages are, were 12 or $13 nationally. They're now 16, 18, and we can't find people to fill the roles. And part of it is definitely stimulus. Part of it is definitely subsidies. Part of it is, you know, that population is uh, woefully under-vaccinated and pretty scared of COVID, rightfully so. Um, not every player in the space is providing the most adequate and safe uh, working conditions for those people as well. And, and I also think that in the grand scheme of things, there just aren't enough people to do the job right now for the volumes that are coming through the warehouse. I mean, I think the stat that, that boggles my mind for the just in case is that there was roughly 275 million square feet of warehouse built this year. The net absorption of that is 100%. Last year or any other given year, it would have been under 200 million and the absorption would have been in the 75 to 80% range. So, I mean, we are, we have people that are just absorbing warehouse space and stuffing warehouses as quickly as they can. And those are all new jobs. And so I think you've not only got a challenge in the existing people like us who are trying to fill the existing space we have, but then also all of the new space that's coming online and trying to support all of that as well. I think that's a very, very valuable point. And as Bethann said, I mean, volumes are up 30%, right? So you, you, in it's a way, it's, it's, not, it's not direct correlation, but you need probably 30% more labor or something along, along those lines, right? Um, Tim, any, any thoughts, perspective on the labor front? It, you know, the one just on the warehousing side, having spent some time there, it's incredible to understand what the vacancy rates are, you know, and with some of the core gateways, it's just uh, amazing. Some of this never been seen before. So pivot off that from a labor standpoint, we fortunately never let anyone go or furlough anyone during those times. And it was those frontline workers on the ports, on the ships, and then we retained our folks, fortunately, that were remote um, in offices, and collectively, let's say a couple thousand folks. Um, what we're seeing when we talk about the wages, I look at it beyond that, not just the wages, Paul, but I look at our trucking. Our trucking costs are up 10%. Our inland fuel costs are up 61%. The cost for me to take care of the uh, mariners on the ships from food and so forth is up 25%. That's not MNR. Uh, fuel on, on the ships, fuel for the ships burn natural gas. We're not to the electric side yet, the marine industry, but <laughs> we're as clean as they get with natural gas so with our ships. Um, those are up over 25, 30%, and that's since February. I go into our other ships that are burning ultra low sulfur diesel. That's up 100% since last year. Those are just our cost items. And now I haven't even gotten to what some labor costs are when you're looking to bring in new hires on top of that. So as we come down to some of the points when volume starts settling down, some of my concerns of these inflationary points that are going up, what's going to stick? What is going to be that new average wage to bring somebody in? And it's a time now that we're, you know, having those discussions with customers to do some cost recovery and do educations on both sides because they're seeing it themselves. So to me, that's one of the more interesting points coming out of this. So I want to pivot. Um, Beth Ann, you're last here because you're, you're here on this say you're here, Mike, with the, the, the question. And so you're you'll 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 uh, you'll go clean up. Okay. Um, so the White House announced last week that the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach are gonna go 24-7. Okay. What impact will this announcement have on resolving the supply chain issues? I'm, I'm teeing this like up on a, on a, no, that's why I want you to go last. I, that's, I'm putting this like a little ball on, on a tee ball, um, setting it up for you guys. So uh, we'll start with you, Farouk. Yeah, so I would say I'm, I'm gonna be the most politically correct probably of everyone. I, I'd say it's unclear, but I don't think it will have- Is that because you're publicly traded? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. I, I don't think it will be um, the impact that the administration hoped it would be. Very, very, very safe answer. Uh, Dave, T uh, Sid Brown would appreciate it if, as if you're open and candid and as transparent. As a privately held company, I'm going to say it's not going to do a damn thing. <laughs> Last night, there was a gentleman who works for a competitor of ours in the Ocean Freight Forwarding site who took a taco truck down to the LA Long Beach for a second shift. Three trucks showed up after midnight last night. They can load 60 an hour, 70 an hour, something like that. Three. They didn't expand the windows yet. Like, this is not the problem. There are a lot of other problems. And if you want to get political, we can talk about AB5 for a little while. But there are some issues that are 
preventing enough drivers from being able to get to the port and pull the containers out. Mr. Nolan. I agree with the two gentlemen, Paul. I, and, and the main thing is I, I read a similar article actually. That David probably read the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And it was amazing to see Paul, like, you know, five truckers or whatever the number yeah, it was, was. It was amazing actually. to see that. The other is recently with one of the leading stevedore companies, terminal operators. And it came back to one of the elements they said as well, which a ship that may have four gangs traditionally work in a ship has one or two gangs work in a ship. And it comes down to there's no space on the terminal to put cargo, whether it's stacked with empties, whether it's full containers that they're trying to get off at a slow pace, or they have to cut and run to get back out to try to get back on schedule at an origin point and leave empties, hence more congestion on dock. So I think there's a much more to it than just that 24-7 uh, window they're trying to open up here. You ready? There we go. Well, you already stole my thunder. You know, the absolutely nothing. I was going to say zero, but, you know, <laughs> the reality, you know, the 24-7 is a headline, but the reality in Los Angeles and Long Beach is that they have been operating 20 hours a day, six days a week for the last decade. So they have had to scale back from that during COVID because of labor issues, equipment issues, truck issues, and the fact that you know, they were paying to keep the gates open and, and nobody was showing up. So the whole supply chain has to be available to operate 24 uh, seven. They're not. The warehouses and distribution centers are, are chock-a-block. They're, they're filled to the rafters. Uh, we know that cargo is being stored in containers, either on chassis, tying up the chassis, or they're just being stored and warehoused in the terminals. In, in LA and Long Beach in particular, they are literally counting the number of boxes that go out during the day so that they can plan how many can come off the ship at night. You know, it's, it's, it's the Tetris game and let's not let those, you know, containers, you know, uh, pile up to the top. So uh, it, there are, are problems throughout the supply chain and opening the terminals 24 seven is gonna do absolutely nothing. So that, that leads me to my next question. So I think uh, the deputy secretary mentioned that there's 17 billion earmarked for ports. And I, I believe he said, don't misquote me here, but I think he said railroads too. That doesn't sound like a ton to me when you're talking about a trillion dollar, um, you know, budget that they're trying to push through. So, so what's your perspective? Is, is that enough? What else needs to be done? It, that's not going to help the problem either. Right, so it's 17 billion for port infrastructure. I think it's actually only a billion for rail. Um, but you can't build yourself out of this. That rail, that port money that's available is for berths and wharfs and roadways going into the marine terminals and, and rail, extra rail connections and things like that. We need to fundamentally, in, in my opinion, address the labor issues, address the trucking issues, and AB5 in California is now proposed in New York and New Jersey as well. Uh, that is going to kill the capacity of the trucking market. So when, the, when we hit the troughs, the independent owner operators just went off and did something else. The employee drivers got laid off. They started collecting unemployment, then they got the stimulus. They haven't gone back to work. So the, 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 the model of independent owner operators actually helps with the, the, the normal uh, flex in the, in the supply chain. We have seasonality in the supply chain and that those independent owner operator models actually help that. You know, the, the other, the equipment issues uh, have to be addressed and we have to get the empty containers the heck out of the United States and back to origin but the ocean carriers cut and run. You know, we have more empty containers sitting in all of our marine terminals uh, than, than we have loads. And they just have to, there has to be an incentive for the ocean carriers, or there has to be pressure on these foreign ocean carriers to all, to, notwithstanding, um, <laughs> but all of the, all of the foreign you know, ocean carriers who are just piling empty containers up you know, in the United States, they have to get out of here. Um, until that happens, nothing's going to change. So how many ships do you have uh, at anchor outside of just one? one. Okay. One. The port of New York and New Jersey has not had the problem 
that the other ports have had. Uh, we have in, the, in September and the first week of October, uh, those were our worst uh, days uh, with, with ships at anchor. And it was mostly because there was just a convergence of ships that were off schedule that all arrived at the same time. And at that time we had seven or eight ships, but they don't remain at anchor for more than a day and a half. Uh, for the last 10 days, we've had just one ship at anchor uh, every day, uh, year to date average is a year and a half. And the reason for that is that we have the capacity in the marine terminals, unlike Savannah, Los Angeles, Long Beach, where they're literally metering what's coming off the ship. The, the undersecretary you know, stated that it's taking three, four days to unload a ship in California now. Those ships should be unloaded in 36 hours. Right. You know, so because they're metering the amount of cargo that's coming off, they're sitting at the dock much longer than they, than they should be. And that's all the more reason why they want to cut and run. They sat at anchor for you know, two, three, four weeks. Then they sit at the dock for four or five days. They want to get out of dodge as quickly as possible. So what's your prediction of how long it would take to chisel through? I don't know. I get different numbers out there. So I hear 70, there were 72, and then apparently there was 25 en route, and, and I'm in that business, and uh, we're, we're very big on, on the West Coast, and you know, we deal very closely with the rail. We strip the containers. We pump the LCL business through our network. And so that's my life. And our issue is if I can't get containers to, to send it out my doors, it doesn't matter how much I can bring in the doors, right? That's my constraint is going out. And so we don't see that improving anytime soon. So what, what's your prediction? If you had a crystal ball, what's your prediction of how long it's going to take to chisel yes. through? Yeah. Yesterday in LA Long Beach, there were a hundred ships between being at anchor and drifting just outside the anchorage, 100 ships with more than a half a million containers on board. And those are just containers, right? This doesn't include those bulk, just containers. right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't, doesn't include anything else. I can't, I can't even begin to tell you what, how long it's gonna to take to get through that. And there's more coming, you know, there's more coming. So, so uh, my last question, and I'll kind of you know, build off of that, um, and then we'll open up to the audience, but, uh, no one has a crystal ball, but but if you did, when do you when do you believe that we get back to pre-COVID levels of of volume pumping through our, our system? And or are we ever going to get back to pre-COVID? Like what's the new normal going to look like? And when do you think we'll get there? Again, from my from my perspective, the volumes and what we have out in LA, that's going to feed through the supply chain. It's going to take months to get through that. I don't see us getting through current situation through the end of next year. Okay, that's my prediction. But with that, again, what are your thoughts? I'll start with you, Dave. So it has to start with consumer demand waning, right? And I think the biggest thing that's driving this 30% plus you know, growth is these retailers had an amazing year in 2020 and they're convinced they can keep this business. And the truth of the matter is it's really unlikely that's true. But the question is when? And so my, what I've, and our clients want to know the same, answer the same question. My answer has been second half of next year. And the logic is the, the polish or the shine is going to wear off of this demand here coming after Christmas. People aren't going to be able to get what they want on the shelves. The government is going to be pumping money in their pocket, but it takes time for that demand to slow down all the way back at origin. And so it's going to take a Chinese New Year like slowdown that's going to give people a chance to take a breath. But again, I think the biggest challenge is the bottleneck right now is at the warehouse level, right? And this is me saying this as a part of a large warehouser. It's not, it, it partly is the demand coming outbound from the DCs to the stores. There is not quite the demand as what has been ordered to come in. And so that's going to have to settle itself before we can see a right sizing of this because the the delicate balance of our supply chain that's been thrown out of whack isn't going to be able to be rebalanced until we can get our domestic warehousing logistics under control into a more predictable routine like it was before. And I think that's going to take at least the second half of the year for that to happen. So second half 2022, that's your prediction. Yes. Mr. Nolan. I'm aligned with Dave on a lot. And I, I think there's consumer demand is key. I think the safety stock is a big 
push where the retailers had this extended lead time. They say four to eight weeks for West Coast, mm -hmm. four to 12 weeks for the East Coast. In addition, what they, when they traditionally ordered, add that on to it. So I think they've been pushing through There's overstock in the warehouses. That will settle down when they start seeing the retail stores not having the same demand. I think the federal funding that has dried up is, is going to have an impact as well. I think the other element will also be inflation. People see what they're paying at the pump. People are going to have less money in their pocket. The, the everyday uh, person to be able to go spend. Groceries are more expensive. They won't have as much disposable income to go out and spend. So my prediction will be third quarter. The only potential is you have season. That's around that time as well, coming in from uh, Asia for imports for the holidays. So may carry in fourth quarter, but I'm saying third quarter. And we're going to have to make up for this Christmas, right? We're going to make up for next Christmas. Double down. Don't, don't tell okay. my son that. Oh, sorry, Will. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see things begin to even out until into 23, after Chinese New Year in 2023. Um, and I think what is going to drive most of it, because that just in case model, I don't think is going to change until there's herd immunity in all of the, the production countries. So, you know, so long as there's a risk that uh, factories are going to be shut down in India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Shanghai, and everywhere else. I think the retailers, the shippers are going to continue to have that stock, you know, built up um, and then, and then we'll see an evening out. All right, Farouk. I got the, the anchor leg here. Yes, you do. So, 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 so I'm generally aligned uh, with the group. So remember we're, you know, we're serving both industrial and consumer side of the thing. So we're a little bit less, uh, you know, exposed to just uh, consumer demand. So. But, you know, I've always thought third quarter, um, you know, I think it's obviously a consumer issue and then it's, it's a people issue. When are people going to come back to work, um, you know, they, the way they were before, but I'd probably say third quarter next year is what, you know, I hope second quarter, but most likely third quarter. So the takeaway is we basically have at least another year of this, right? So with that, I'll open it up to uh, Gary. You want to ask questions? Oh, Mr. <laughs> Jordan. Oh, wow. Okay. Everyone's ready. So question for all of you on, on cost. I know Tim brought it up. Um, certainly, um, we all have seen container rates go from 2,500 to 25,000, um, but that's only part of the cost. So I'm interested to hear all of your cost. How much of that cost has been passed on at this point? And how long is it gonna take to really cycle all the way through uh, all of the all of the costs around labor, fuel, everything else, as far as the, the full supply chain costs will, will be absorbed within the commodity costs, even on the industrial side, to where that will start to drive demand signal. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so I think we were pretty good at passing costs on in, in 2021. 2022 is gonna be challenging. Um, you know, we're definitely hitting an inflationary environment for us, our costs have gone up are estimated to go up next year in a manner that they haven't in a really long time. And it's going to lead to, um, you know, the railroads have been pretty good at getting pricing, right? In most aspects of the business, you know, we, we obviously have a favorable industry structure that more times than not affords that. But um, these are tough conversations um, into 2022, you know, you know, being a business with almost 50% margins, um, you know, whose service product is, is not as good as it's, it's been historically um, approaching price um, aspirations that we haven't in a long time. So our intent is our costs are going up and our expectation is our customers' costs are going up as well and they're passing those on to their customers. But um, I'm not convinced it's linear, um, but, uh, you know, we'll see going into next year. So for the Port Authority, there's two different operating models for Port Authorities uh, in the United States. There's landlord Port Authorities just own the land and lease it out to uh, third party private companies who are the terminal operators and, and whatnot. And then there's operating Port Authorities who it's Port Authority staff that are loading and unloading the ships and contracting with the ocean carriers and whatnot. Uh, so the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is a landlord Port Authority. So for us, our, our rates are fixed. Uh, we have long-term leases with the terminal operators that uh, right now go out to 2029. 
uh, and there's no opportunity, you know, for us um, to increase our rates, you know, during that time frame. Uh, the terminal operators, in turn, have contracts with the ocean carriers, um, and those are our fixed contracts as well. Uh, there's a lot of criticism or a lot of discussion about demurrage and detention, uh, leaving your boxes on the terminal longer than the four days on average in New York uh, that is contractually allowed. Uh, but the shippers are, are warehousing their cargo uh, in the container, sitting in the container terminal. So that's where the terminal operators do see an increase uh, in their revenue uh, but it's a contractually um, laid out obligation. The ports of Savannah, for example, is an op port of Savannah is an operating port. Uh, I can't speak to what they've been do what they've been doing in terms of uh, any increased costs and what they might be passing on. Uh, but just as an example of who, of who's an operating port. Rick, I gave you a, a fair amount of insight in the sense of the costs and inflation that I know we're incurring as a, a business. Um, as you're going into contract season with a lot of customers now, which now to the end of the year into first quarter for us, there are challenging discussions that we're having. We're trying to put out the facts, give the education on what's taking place, but those same customers are having their own increase in inflationary costs themselves in other areas. So we have, it's more recovery, I should say, than being able to stay totally in front of it as costs are going up right now a lot quicker over the past like six months than what they had over the prior year. So uh, I guess in a quick nutshell, we, we don't have the luxury. We're a domestic shipping company owner operator. Um, we're not like the international guys that were able to charge $20,000 or uh, an FEU. Would be very nice to be able to do that. <laughs> you don't worry about the inflationary costs as much. Um, but in our area, it's, it's gonna be an interesting uh, contract season with customers and trying to recover these inflationary costs. I'd, I'd echo your comments around recovery. I think that's been our MO more than anything else. And a lot of it is just because our long-term contracts and warehousing and dedicated trucking aren't structured for inflationary concepts like this. And CPI doesn't represent, which is almost always the anchor in a contract, rarely represents well against situations like this. So we've had a lot of really hard intra-contract rate increase conversations uh, that trying to recover things. What I think is going to be interesting is that you know, you think about fuel, there are some, you know, mechanisms for pass through on variable costs in this, in, in this industry. But next year, what's coming is a very different increase in costs. So just as an example, one of the largest trailer manufacturers in the country just announced that they're only going to produce about 20,000 trailers next year, mm -hmm. instead of 35,000. So all of a sudden, now you're talking about just literally not even be able to move people's goods. That inflationary cost is now it's no longer, I can't, I, I'm giving you a rate increase. It's now I'm giving you the boot and you've got to go find it from somebody else. And then I'd add in that shippers today are saying yes, because they're in that just in case mode and they're trying to take market share as aggressively as they can and maintain the massive sales that they've gained. As we start to get to the backside of this and things and the reality starts to wash off, those conversations are going to get harder because now they're going to be in recovery mode trying to figure out a way to take on those costs from us without being able to really pass it along to the consumer. So I think next year is going to be an even harder year for these conversations than these, this year's been. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Beth Ann. The New Jersey person speaks to the New Jersey person. So um, I first have a comment and then I have a real world question that I'm actually trying to solve now that I think you could be very helpful with. The first is I take a very different view on detention demurrage. I have seen carriers charge it where contractually they're not allowed to. I've also seen the numbers that they're of their profitability from detention demurrage and how their bond ratings have gone through the roof. And so, you know, there there is profit taking coming out of this from many, many ends, as much as there's horrible things going on. And I don't think we can hide from that and talk, talk about warehousing by shippers when shippers try to pull things off the pier and can't do it. And I think, so it's a, two, it's a two-folded problem. And I think uh, to make it monolithic is not really the true picture. The question is, though, I have a shipper, one of 10 largest outbound shippers in the country. 
multiple ports, not yours, they cannot go in and pick up an empty. They are given appointments, they show up, no empty. They, are, they call for, for empties, they're told they can't get them. So I was very surprised, and you know, I certainly believe you, you know, you, you know, you know better than I, that there's all these empties sitting out there when a top 10 outbound shipper, when we have this huge imbalance anyway, can't pick up an empty. I, 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 if you could repeat that, yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I didn't actually hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, so, so, no, I'm no, having a hard time. I, I got it, Ron. I, I listened very well, especially you. I have a lot of respect for you. Um, so the question was, you commented that um, all these empties are sitting there in the terminals. Ron has an export customer who goes to the terminal to get an empty and can't get the darn empty. And so it's like, it's conflicting with what you're saying. So what do you think the issue is behind that? Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah. As long as it's not happening in New York, New Jersey, it's okay. I, 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 um, actually, I think I can answer for that because again, so, so Ron, what's happening, my sense is what's happening in LA Long Beach is the import is such a freaking disaster that that's clogging up the terminal and the gates. And by default, the imports have to have priority. And so they're, they're feeding the imports to keep this, this machine going. And, and as a result, they're not able to get, the, truckers are not able to go in and get the export box. I, I think, quite honestly, I think that's the root cause of it. It's that simple. Fair enough. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, there are a whole host of scenarios that happen. You know, they could be trying to do a double move and it's, you know, lunchtime or dinner time. And, you know, they don't want to, you know, go through the time of a double move being the terminal operator. Uh, you know, there, there could be, you know, an issue that the size and type of empty container that needs to be delivered, you know, to the trucker for the export is, you know, at the bottom of the pile and it's going to take, you know, so much longer in order to get it. Um, it it's a very situational, you know, issue. Uh, they also, you know, the exports coming out of the United States have also always been, um, you know, a, a couple hundred dollars. And it was, and it was just, hey, we're going that way anyway, you know, we'll, we'll take your exports. Now, again, as we said, the, the shipping lines just want to cut and run. They don't want to deal in exports or empties. They also so. don't want to tie their box up in inland China waiting right. for it to be unloaded. And available because then it isn't able to be exported again from Asia quick enough. So yeah. there's a couple of friction points there yeah. that are at, at odds with each yeah. other. Ron, have your, have your customer call me. We, we can do a street turn for him. Yeah, I was just gonna say- I got, I, 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 I got you covered. That. Yeah. Got you covered. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. Um, to say this is a complicated situation is probably the understatement of the world. Um, and there's no easy answer, but I certainly appreciate every of the panelists' honest comments. As a practitioner, it's kind of refreshing to hear that uh, keeping a port open is not going to solve the world's problems. It's much more complicated than that. But on a more positive note, uh, I'd like maybe a quick answer from each of you. What we've gone through, what we've learned from having gone through this, if we had a do-over, what would we have done differently? Farouk, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, you like um, being on the spot. Yeah, I don't mind being on the spot. So um, very, I'll give you a very parochial answer. And, um, and uh, I'm speaking as a company is, look, uh, I, I think, um, you know, again, uh, the operating model that our company, um, you know, and the Union Pacific, the two Canadian railroads operate under has been very um, successful for all companies. Uh, but, um, you know, you put yourself in a very difficult spot when something unprecedented happens. And I'm talking specifically about running a, you know, extraordinarily lean operation, right? It's it works uh, phenomenally well, you know, um, when things are humming, 
but when there's a major issue like that, like the, like what we've been through the last year and a half, you struggle through it. So, and I'm I'm speaking specifically, you know, we quantify. You know, again, um, I'll give you a I'm going to give you a long-winded answer now. I think one of the biggest mistakes the railroads have made have have given Wall Street such visibility into our headcount numbers because it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, you know, what does it matter? They all want to know, um, you know, um, uh, and as a result, um, we, uh, you know, um, have to answer to why we're not reducing employees, right? And, um, you know, I think that's a big mistake in here because if you did the math and you look at all the business that's being left in the ground right now because we don't have enough people, um, it far outweighs the cost savings to, to run such a, highly lean operation. You know, if, if, if there was a do-over, right, of a pandemic, I, I think from the Port of New York and New Jersey's perspective, you know, we, we pretty much nailed it. You know, we, we made health and safety, you know, the, the top priority from, from day one. You know, with New York, you know, New Jersey being the epicenter, you know, of, of the pandemic, we actually had, you know, a, a health and safety task force you know, that was designed to keep all of the workers in the port, not just the port authority, but the longshore labor, you know, on the front lines, the truckers, we had, we had a PPE committee that was sourcing masks from all over the world, uh, not just for the company that was, was able to buy them, but for all of the supply chain partners, you know, across the way. Um, you know, we have a forum in place uh, that's called the Council on Port Performance that, uh, gets the entire supply chain, executives of industry, from every aspect of the supply chain, including the government entities, Customs and Border Protection, that's clearing cargo, uh, that get together and have the, from the pandemic, are together every week looking at issues that were coming down the pike. How can we stay ahead of them? Uh, it was designed as a resilience initiative five, six years ago. And I think that is the reason why the Port of New York and New Jersey is not you know, in the headlines like, you know, Savannah and, and the West Coast ports. I don't think that if there was another, you know, um, demand for cargo of 30% that anybody could have done anything differently. Um, so I, I just think from the pandemic perspective, um, you know, we, I think we did what was necessary. You look at what happened on the West Coast, you know, the numbers of longshore deaths, unfortunately, and illnesses and, and hundreds and hundreds of longshore workers in quarantine at a time, um, th they didn't really begin to focus on changing the work rules until, until way down, you know, the, the path. So, um, you know, for us, I think we would stay the course with the pandemic. I, I think, you know, we, we did everything that we needed to do. And the what we did actually uh, uh, paid off in what we're experiencing now in terms of the best fluidity that we could. I'm sorry? Well, so, so interestingly, there was a time uh, in 2014-15 that the Port of New York and New Jersey was abysmal. Uh, we had supply chain congestion in every aspect of the supply chain. And there were other issues that were going on in the West Coast. It was the time of the ILWU uh, labor, you know, uh, issues. And, and we created the Council on Poor Performance in response to that issue. Um, and again, it was designed as a resiliency initiative. When we designed that, other ports around the country followed suit. Uh, Norfolk created something similar, Savannah did, LA Long Beach did, and they all kept them going for about a year, a year and a half, and then they just petered out. Um, I believe that if they were still working and talking, you know, with each other, that uh, they would not have had some of the, the issues that they've had. You know, I, did, I would say first, when you look from a resource standpoint, specifically personnel, my biggest shout out goes to I would say our, our, the 2000 folks I work with, especially the mariners who are on ships for 10 weeks at a time being quarantined where they couldn't get off and on just to keep the ship safe, the frontline workers. But as we went, we went into it, that's a lot to ask of people. And we, we, our medical staff within the country were of course the, some of the main heroes here, but there are a lot of others, especially in the supply chain world. 
it's been a lot of work for them, a lot of strain to handle that 30% increase too. Is, has business been okay? It has. Have costs gone up? Yeah, but it's been a strain on folks. That's one thing where you look at, is there something we could have done to maybe alleviate some of that? But it's also been hard getting people to come into work. The other would be for us, it's, we've had times where we've been able to turn on equipment. So Hurricane Maria took place in Puerto Rico a few years back. It was a, an island of 3 million people, but it was kind of what is going on with uh, Long Beach and others with the congestion and just the flow of goods and folks pushing it down. We were able to go on higher equipment, chassis, you know, whether uh, more maritime assets, more containers. Here, we didn't have the ability to do that. So it was really, is there a way to kind of see that a little bit earlier where maybe you bring a few more assets on so you're not as strained in those areas? Um, and then the other is with customers, I feel we have some very good relationships with customers, but this is all a learning lesson for all of us. So it's planning. What more can we plan collectively to prepare and both understand what's coming in front of us? Where this, neither of us knew, right? We're both trying to work through the, the challenges that aren't always that easy. So. This is a really tough question. It is. Uh, I think that the planning scenario, modeling type things that our most supply chain organizations are not doing today to understand in a contingency situation like this, how you handle a facility in Wisconsin being shut down and shifting production over to a facility in Illinois. And what does that mean to my distribution patterns, et cetera, is one thing. I think the other thing is <clears throat> the market economics of supply chain dictate that the cheapest provider wins the business. And that is something that has decimated certain aspects of our domestic supply chain and has left the base core providers and the truckload providers specifically to not be able to proactively invest in their business. And so I would argue that if we could go back, I would, and I have always advocated for less of a vendor customer relationship and more of a partnership and understanding that there are base economic needs that have to be fundamentally met in order for a company to be able to prepare and plan and live through an event like we just lived through. And I think if you don't have that, then we don't get through this any differently than we did this time. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, our time is up. Unfortunately, we have, I know there's a lot of other questions out there, but maybe we can ask some questions when we uh, go to the reception. Everyone is invited to the reception in the grand lobby. I wanna thank all of our panelists for a thank terrific- you yeah, thank you all very much for a terrific dialogue. Uh, our previous panel, our Salzburg recipient, our student uh, award winners. Thank you all for all the people who helped put the program together. Thank you very, very much for all your efforts. Thank you all very much for today. We appreciate it. <laughs>